Let's take this call real quick, then we'll get into my big rant about impact. Who is this, and where are you calling from? Well, this is a mark, but not the mark in particular that you are looking for. Well, We love all marks. Yeah, we love marks. Well, this mark is DECA. Uh, <laughs> DECA's calling back. How's it going? It's going very well. I believe you're I our first repeat caller. That. No, well, we've had some on the Daily Show. Okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, DECA. Okay. Um, I don't want to be accused like... Ed and the other person that we won't speak of, of calling into the show too often. So I just want to ask my question and bow out. All right. Uh, Vince Russo is set to appear on the TNA Spin Cycle this week, a program which I think I saw once. Um, I was wondering what your predictions are for Vince Russo's uh, behavior and what he will say during the show and if he will bring up about how if he could have made fun of Bertha Faye's weight. That's entirely possible. I was going to say that I predict he will say he never wanted to appear on camera, but he had to. Sure. Oh, I get that. He, that he didn't want to appear on Spin Cycle, but he was forced. He was so. so he, was, <laughs> yeah, he had no option. He had to come save the show. Well, Mister Mister uh, Drablin, I I um I'm a little concerned because as I'm going to rant about here when we get talking about Impact, the show is getting more and more inside. I mean, we had an entire segment today about interviews in two newspapers in the U.K. that there is no earthly way that more than about 10% of the audience had even heard of. Not to mention the fact we had Foley coming on the air and, and dropping references to Vince McMahon yelling at him in his headset while he did commentary on SmackDown, which, again, if 10% of the people watching this show are aware of that, I would be stunned. So I'm I'm getting very concerned. We've got them talking about Jared being the founder. It's getting really, really inside, and I'm getting petrified that Russo is going to have some sort of role at some point, or I don't know. This spin cycle, I, I, I just get worried when I see everything else on impact. It's back to the good old days of, uh, Sid, do you have your scissors? <laughs> it is! It is! And uh, the other one that Bischoff had to say twice because the fans didn't react. Yeah, yes. he, he said yeah. it and nobody reacted, and so he said it again, like, "Oh, maybe they haven't heard me." No, they heard you. They just didn't Don't, understand no. what the fuck you were yeah. talking about. So, all right, Deco. Well, we very much appreciate the call. Got to head back to the Impact review tonight, but thanks for being the uh, second uh, repeat caller here on the uh, Brian and Vinny show. No problem. Have a good night. Guys. All right, have a good night. See ya. Yeah. That was uh, Deca Durablin, our uh, steroid. Speaking of. Our call on a steroid, yes. Speaking of. Not a steroid user, an actual roid. Apparently there's the steroid testing in TNA is, is about to actually happen. Of course, as, as I noted many weeks back here on the show, they did steroid testing. A bunch of dudes failed, and they went up to the guys and they said, you failed. And the guy said, all right. That's the end of the that story. Was that was the entire conversation. You know, and maybe there was some <laughs> they, stuff in there about... They approached the roid users and said, you're using steroids. And the guy said, sure. Well, there may have been some some discussion about tainted supplements and the like. That sort of deal. But anyway, the point is they're now supposedly really going to be testing. They're supposedly really going to be, um, you know, penalties. So I just cannot wait. Two, one of two things is going to happen. Either a number of the guys in the show are going to completely wither away. Or nobody's going to wither away, and that will answer all of our questions about the TNA drug policy. One or the other is going to happen. I don't like to mention any names here, like Sheikh Abdul Bashir, but everybody saw the man in WWE when he was a skinny, rail-like man, and now he is fucking gigantic. I believe JBL's exact line concerning this man was, if we only put his brain in, in a, uh, Muhammad Hassan's body, Yeah, they found a way. They did. They found a way. He is bigger, I believe, than Muhammad Hussain was during his peak. Close. So there you go, everybody. I didn't want to throw anybody's name out there, but I just I thought of that when I was watching his match and how how dramatically he is he has changed his physique. So the show opened with ODB and Angelina Love, and moments into this, Mike Tanay started talking about Angle and all of his comments in the Sun and the Daily Star, and he said it would be addressed tonight. 
And this was when Don West said that Kurt Angle had been sent to the U.K. to do a promotional tour, and then, quote, he said all those things. What things? I don't know. They didn't tell us. It's a mystery. <laughs> I, I had never read the story. He but... said all those... You didn't even read it. No. So to, to this moment, I still don't know specifically what he said. You are a wrestling reporter who is paid. <laughs> yes. And you have no idea what he said. Not a clue what Don West is talking about. Jesus Christ. So anyway, then uh, he said Jeff Jarrett was far beyond livid, which was true. And he said if they... Um, he said... Um, actually, that was all he said. Well, so they, they, they said other things not about pertaining to that particular... Discussion. Uh, they were talking about the pay-per-view. During this Angelina Love ODB match, they mentioned that the title match of the pay-per-view would, would be Taylor, Taylor Wilde defending her title against ODB and Roxy in a three-way. Yeah. Why? I don't know. Name me a single reason why. Well, because you not... need all the people you can on Bound for Glory. <laughs> that's the answer. Make, they couldn't just make the other one another lumberjack? No. They're doing lumberjacks anyway, aren't they? No, that's WWE pay-per-view. Oh, I got confused. Well, I couldn't figure out one reason why... Either of these women should get a shot, let alone both of them the same night. But then Don West explained it to me. He said he actually said Roxy Laveau earned a title shot by dressing up as Raisha Saeed last week and beating up Awesome Kong. <laughs> that warranted a yeah. championship contender yeah. status. Sure. I hate this company. It gets better later. So uh, Velvet uh, got her hands on ODB's flask, so ODB could not hook up. And then she spit the alcohol in ODB's eyes. Angelina hit her finisher for the pin. So the bloom is off the ODB rose. Or so I thought. The, 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 yeah, yeah. And uh, ODB made her big comeback here. And she she did her trumpet motion, which Don West agree, identified as the old trumpet motion. Yeah. That's his name now. Sure. She plays an invisible instrument. Why? I don't no one know. Knows. I don't and, know why this woman does anything. And then she slaps her ass to set up her comeback. Seriously, that's what she did. And her breast. She does that too. Morash was backstage with Jared, who was red-faced, said he was going to go to the ring tonight to address the angle issue. You know what I hate on the show, among many, many other things? <laughs> I was going to say, there's one thing. <laughs> they do this like five times every show. A reporter or interviewer will go to, to a subject and ask a question, and the, the interview subject won't answer. No. Happens every week, multiple times a week. Or they cut a promo on the girl. Or they cut a promo on the girl. So a then, waste of time. Then ODB met with the blonde and the one with the big boobs, Tracy, I believe. And she wanted a match with Velvet and Angelina tonight. Yeah, the opener set up the main event the on this show. The main event. They couldn't even wait a week. No, no. She said, I want Angelina Love and, and, and uh, Taylor, uh, Angelina Love and Velvet Sky tonight. And Tracy said, okay. So Tracy now is no longer knockout law. Tracy can also cancel segments in the show and book women's tag matches at will. Well, she's in charge of the women's division, essentially. Yeah, but this thing was not booked. So you would think, figure at some point something else was. So she canceled that for this. Unless it was another women's match. Or they had no main event. Or they just had nothing planned. So, yeah, that was that. And um, she also said that you can you can get a partner, but it can't be anybody involved in the women's match at the pay-per-view, which kind of limited the options. <laughs> so it also, again, makes this match even more pointless because it won't plug anything on the pay-per-view. And finally, ODB called Tracy Boobzilla, which is both accurate and at the same time ironic considering ODB's own surgical enhancements. Then she copped a feel on her breasts and ass and says something about balls and then walked out and I have no idea what this woman is. <laughs> I cannot identify her in, in, in any social strata. I don't understand her at all. She defies explanation. Jared came out and said that some people thought he didn't have a chance against Kurt, but his back had been against the wall his entire career. He was a skinny punk kid starting out that nobody gave a chance to. Yeah, that's that's rare in this business. And he said that everybody thought the TNA was going to die which, of course, he never mentions the fact that it was going to die until they found these investors. He also never mentioned it. There's lots of skinny punk kids who don't make it in this business. They're not often the promoter's son. Yeah. So anyway, then he said that literally hundreds had gone in the grave trying to battle the big empire up north. <laughs> hundreds have died fighting Vince McMahon. The, the promoters have died left and right <laughs> trying to beat Vince. Apparently. Hundreds. Hundreds. Gone to the grave. Gone to the grave. So and then... He said that the company was never stronger than it was today, which is true. And he said nothing would ever bring down TNA, which is not true. He said Kurt had aired some dirty laundry in the U.K. And then proceeded to read select quotes, such as Kurt saying he may leave next year, depending on how he feels about the company. And Jeff Jarrett was appalled. And I thought, why are you appalled? <laughs> said, Isn't every single person under contract going to make that exact same decision? He said he was going to consider his options. Isn't Christian going to consider his options? 
Isn't every single person under contract going to consider their <laughs> options? Isn't Jimmy Rave going to consider his options? Yes. Isn't Everybody Shark Boy is going to consider, going to consider their options. So anyway, then he then he read a part about how Kurt praised Vince, saying he had a father and son uh, bond, and Jarrett then claimed that um, once Angle figured out he had a match with Jarrett at the pay per view, he wanted out of the company. And I thought, where did he say that in the interview? I didn't see that anywhere. He said when his contract was up, he'd consider his options. What the fuck does that have to do with wanting to leave now? So then, Jared said that two years ago, Angle had made some horrible comments about Vince. And at the time, Jared felt it was best not to air it. But now, he said, he had a change of heart. And they aired footage of Angle, who was a good 30 pounds heavier, saying he wanted to beat Vince's ass. Vince wasn't a genius. He was a fucking fool. Called Vince all sorts of terrible things that were bleeped out. Said he was dead to him. And said in two years, Vince would be kissing his ass. Two years. That was a funny line, by the way. How coincidental. And then Jared said Angle had claimed that Jared could never break the father-son bond that he had with Vince. And then he said, well, Kurt, looks like I just did. This was so goddamn dumb. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Okay, do do so. There are many, many reasons why, why this was dumb. First off, it didn't sell a single pay-per-view buy. Not a single one. Number two... You probably pissed Kurt Angle off. You tried to go in there and and screw up what he thought was some sort of... He's been talking nice things about Vince lately. And Jarrett aired this, and Jarrett really did try to fuck that up. That's number two. Number three, you made your own company look so goddamn ghetto. That's the key. Because two That's years ago, Angle was hating Vince McMahon. And now two years later, instead of Vince kissing Kurt's ass, Kurt is kissing Vince's ass. Yes. What does that tell you about TNA? They suck. They're and, a horrible place to be. And finally, the storyline is, this is number four, the storyline is apparently that Kurt Angle wants out of TNA. And Jared is trying to keep him there against his will. And beat him. Isn't it the fucking stupidest thing you've ever heard of? <laughs> it's really, really, really dumb. The, 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 I don't know. I, and I, we, can, we can top this off. People may be intrigued now. They may go look up this uh, UK Sun interview, and they may see the other horrible things Kurt Angle said about Jared. I, I, sure. I, I understand. Yeah, they, they, I, they, they plugged the article where he buried everything. I, I have not read the article, but I understand he said a lot more than what they put on here. Yes. They aired they air this, this promo, and I actually thought it, it was just totally in character. Uh, it was two years ago, so Kurt may have been insane, but I just, the whole line, the, the perfect coincidence, in two years, you'll be kissing my ass. Not three, not one, not five, two. Two. It just happened to work out that way. I suspect he cut that line about five times with different year numbers in there, and they just plugged <laughs> in the one he wanted. Let's take a call very quickly. Who's this, and where are you calling from? Hey, guys, it's Chris in Ohio. Hey, what's going on? I thought it'd be Kurt in Orlando. That'd be awesome. No. <laughs> Not much. Glad to finally get in. I've been trying to call all night. Um, a couple things I wanted to mention. I first wanted to say that on Impact, um, I thought they mentioned WWE way too much. Oh, yeah. oh God, yes. We're, there's more to come. Yes. I think it sounds really Bush League when they do that, um, and it just makes them seem beneath WWE, which they are, but it, you don't want to make your product seem that way. It does, and they are, and that was so clear at some points in the show. Well, I, I don't know if you, you guys have heard this yet, but I wanted your thoughts on it. TNA just announced on their website that Steve Mongo McMichael oh, yeah. will be refereeing the Monsters Ball match at what? the uh, Bound for Glory paper. Yes. No, I have not heard this. Yes. And I was curious your thoughts on that because I think that is ridiculous. Well, they're, they're doing it. They're doing it simply because they want a Chicago tie-in that's going to get them some press. That's true. There is and, that. Okay. I mean, I mean, in some ways, it's a good idea, but. I've seen Steve McMichael when he was actually in this business, and the idea of Steve McMichael, 10 years older, having not been in this business and not been in a ring, trying to maneuver his way around a Monsters Ball match. With eight men. This is going to be a complete disaster. Just a complete disaster. But my, I actually have a thought. Maybe they'll find out that Steve McMichael is actually Abyss's father. Could be. If you think about it. He very much, he very well could be. There's a resemblance there. You know, the, the thing also, um, the thing also with the, um, the, the WWE references is when there was an actual war going on and both companies were very, very strong, it was one thing to mention the competition because it seemed like a war and everybody knew about both sides. Mm -hmm. This is such a completely one-sided war. 
And WWE never mentions TNA, ever. Uh, yeah, ever, 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 ever. I was thinking about this today. There, there's a promo uh, about two months ago now where JBL was yelling at CM Punk, and he referenced a no-name indie, which I, I don't know why I was thinking about this today, but it occurred to me they Not didn't really. use the name Ring of Honor, Yeah, but they talked about them. They acknowledge that Ring of Honor existed. That means on WWE TV, Ring of Honor is a notch above TNA. <laughs> <laughs> I just... I thought it was interesting, that's all. So so the, the point is that, I mean, it, when you've got two even companies, it's one thing, but you, when you've got company, one company that everyone knows is so much bigger that never acknowledges you, and then you've got the smaller company that's constantly acknowledging the bigger company, it comes up so low rent. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I think that's like with the Mac and PC thing, if you guys have ever seen those commercials. Oh, yeah. I think that the Mac seems so low rent when they go out of their way to bash PC to no end. I just, mm -hmm. I don't agree with that because Macs will never be, they may be better than PCs, but they'll never be up on that level, in my opinion. That's, that's, uh, I think the Mac PC folks are like the TNA fans, actually. Compared to your average wrestling fan. They're, they're very some passionate. Very passionate, particularly Mac users. Yes. It, 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 the comparison doesn't quite work because they, they, they bash PCs, but then they explain what they do better. Whereas TNA has nothing they do better, better than WWE, so that won't work. Yeah. I would say TNA is closer to Linux users in that they're just small and insignificant, but they think they're important. And Tony's right. going to kick your ass he when he hears that. Anything else, Chris? No, nah, that's it, man. Thanks a lot, guys. Hey, thanks very much for calling in. I very much appreciate it. Thanks. Bye-bye. And let's get back to the show here. I can't believe you. Just... Oh, boy, Tony's going to beat you. You may kill me. Then we had the Motor City Machine Guns against LAX in a qualifying match for Monsters Ball. There, there's one thing you're skipping here. They, they, they had a 1,000 20-second segments on the show, and this is one of them. Kurt Angle walked in a half hour after the show started. Jerry Boris ran, ran up to him and said these exact words, Thank God you're here! Oh, that's right. Yes. And even Kurt was befuddled as to why JB would be so excited, and Boris explained, said, uh, You know that video you cut two years ago when you first stood up here bearing Vince? And Angle was like, vaguely, yeah. And JB said, Jared just played it. And Kurt flipped out and had a cow and stormed off. Yeah, because he wants to leave, and they're trying to fuck it up. They're, they're fucking That's when I his, first saw that. They're fucking up his job to get his chance to get a better job with another company. <laughs> so anyway, Motor City Machine Guns against LAX qualifying match for Monsters Ball. Initially, I was like, why the fuck would these guys even want to be in this weapons match? There's no good reason. Well, there was later. Yeah, but the they didn't titles. know that then. No, they didn't. They were just... <laughs> At the time, they were fighting for a chance to be in a weapons match for no reason. Well, number one contenders match, wasn't it? I suppose there's that. I believe there was. Anyway, right. the point is, I love these two teams, but this was a very vanilla match. I totally agree. They, they, yeah. Um, th there was a point where they got the heat on Homicide, and they worked them over, and it was fun, and there was a bunch of cool Motor City Machine Guns double teams, and they did this spot where Saban and Shelly bonked into each other and fell down, and Homicide just waltzed over, strolled over, tagged in hum uh, Hernandez. Hernandez walked in, and he made a comeback devoid of fire. <laughs> You've never seen a big guy throw around smaller men with any less passion. Yeah. So anyway, the the big thing was afterwards when uh, LAX won. Saban tried to springboard, got power bomb for the pin. Anyway, Shelly flipped off LAX behind their backs, and Tony Tanay Tanay was like, "Well, there's a the difference. He's doing it behind their backs. This is exactly what Sting was talking about." Yeah. I, okay. So if you so flip if a you, man off to his face... That's respectful. I don't feel respected right now. <laughs> at all. Literally, at all. But, uh, yes, but if, if you do it behind their back, then you're a weasel. And yeah. they, they, they they censored this. The first one, they did the normal, they digitized it, so you just saw a bunch of squares where Sully's hand was. Then they cut to another shot that I just love, <laughs> where they digitally erased his finger, so it melted into the background. So it looked like he was just holding up his hand in the spot where his finger used to be. No, it was just he was holding up a fist. <laughs> like, how dare you, I'll old fuckers? Because apparently those are the old guys now. Yeah. Uh, because they're young, disrespectful punks. That leads to this question of, wh why at the feud is the young guys versus the old guys? W would the disrespect be shown to LAX, who are younger than a lot of people on the show? They have, because they're idiots. Because they, they, they don't think. No basically. one in this company has a clue. So anyway, then they had the Cornette meeting with Angle, ripped him apart. And I love how the Angle here, by the way, it gets even better. Of the four things that I mentioned, there's a fifth one. And that is, there is blatant, outright censorship in TNA. Yeah. There is no freedom of speech. No. You cannot speak your mind in TNA or you will be fined 25 <laughs> Thousand dollars. Cornet fine angle twenty five grand for burying the company in a press. Yeah. 
<laughs> That's the angle, everyone. There's an employee who hates working there, and he thinks it sucks, and he tells the truth, and so they find him. Yeah. They don't make any changes. No. No. They find him. By the way, th- this is the third uh, third part of one segment. They-, they had a commercial after the Machine Guns match. They came back. They aired, an video, uh, they aired a video of the knockouts talking about Roxy getting her head shaved. They all basically just said, wow, that sucked. I'm glad I didn't almost win that match. And they talked about her bleeding and her her parents screaming at her and wanting her to quit. Then they ran into the pay-per-view. Then there was this bit here with Angle and Cornette. It was all within like three minutes. And then they went to commercial again. That was the whole bit. Yep. God. So then we had Sheik Bashir, Jimmy Rave, and Eric Young. Skipping another third <laughs> There are all these little bits and pieces of the show. What did I miss here? They all, I don't blame you because they all come flying by so quick. The suicide video. Uh, I don't even bother recapping well, there, there, that. Well, there's a key here, because Suicide rambled on for 15 seconds about how he'd, uh, if there was a nuclear war, there'd be cockroaches in him, and he called himself a survivor. Your name is Suicide. By definition, you did not survive, and it's your own fault. <laughs> that pissed me off. Sheik Bashir, Jimmy Rave, and Eric Young. Bashir won with the weapon of mass destruction. Think about that name for a while, everybody. <laughs> they, they, they took out the, the airplanes in his music, and they, now they, his name is his finisher is the WMD, yes. So anyway, they teased problems with Bashir and Shane Sewell, the referee, afterwards, and I will forgive TNA for a lot if Shane Sewell is the next X Division champion. I, uh, X Division champion used to be all the champions. Well, He's yeah. my favorite guy in the company. <laughs> He's pretty great. Jimmy Rave here hit La Mystica, which uh, offended me. He stole Mystico's finisher, which Don West identified as he's spinning around, I don't know what he calls it, <laughs> yeah. And then he reminded us all that last week the Sheik took Samoa Joe to the limit. The limit. <laughs> to the limit. It was all Joe could do to beat the Sheik. Yeah. We had AJ, Lethal, and Christian doing a promo. Doesn't matter. Then we had the match, the three of them against Booker Team 3D. They went for 30 seconds, then went to commercial. Match was fine. And they did do a great spot near the finish where Bubba backdrop all three baby faces one at a time. And then AJ. And uh, I Lethal. believe Lethal teamed up and gave him the world's fattest backdrop, and that scared the shit out of me. It was all great, too, because the faces were clearly having their own personal backdrop contest to see who could get highest. And Kristen went, and then Jay Lethal went, and AJ went last, and AJ won. That's definitely clear. And then, of course, yes, the big payoff was uh, B- Bubba took a big, fat double backdrop. It was so simple and so easy and so cool. Now, the finish, I'll just tell you what they wanted to do. AJ tried a springboard but bonked into Christian. So the two partners that are sort of having issues bonked into each other. And then Lethal, or um, somebody, rolled up uh, Christian for the pin. Anyway, the point is, it sounds fine on paper, but in execution, it was such a clown show. It was like something you'd see at an indie show. I can't even say that because you wouldn't see something that looked this hokey on Ring of Honor, for example. So it there was were a five men mess. involved here, including Booker, Bubba, and the ref, and the two faces. And the, you could see them all looking around at each other to make sure all five of them were in the perfect line for this spot to go off. It looked very, very hokey. And somewhere in here, while this was going on, Don West was shouting out about Booker T hitting somebody with a briefcase. And I actually still, to this moment, don't know what he was talking about. Oh, well, Booker's got a special... He's got the Money in the Bank briefcase. And, and, and somebody got hit with it. Yeah. They I didn't need to. It just made the match more confusing. Sure. That, that's how it always is. Then Jarrett was backstage, or Angle was backstage, threatening to kill Jarrett, and the entire segment went 30 seconds. Less. Yeah. This whole show, it's just a, 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 nothing but 30-second clips. It's painful. Oh, it gets better in the next segment. We had Jarrett, or I'm sorry, we had uh, Tanae doing a verbal debate. Oh, yes. With Sting and Samoa Joe. And because this is total nonstop action, they edited out every single Moment of yeah, silence. I, I, that, that, that's what I wrote down. All dead air has been edited out. It, there was not, I mean, as the thing went two minutes, there was not one second where somebody was not speaking. No. It was just one sentence flowing into each other, flowing into each other. It was, I have no idea what they were talking about. It was I know fi- that they each spoke their piece, but what they said, no idea. <laughs> it, was, it was a five minute segment in which, as we know, they removed Literally all dead air, shrug it down to a minute and a half, and it was confusing and perplexing, and it didn't make me feel any better or worse about either one. Didn't want to make me see the pay-per-view. All I know, oh, there's one line I noted. Sting was talking about how he couldn't understand why Joe would want to kill Booker T or kill a defenseless Kurt Angle. And Joe said, well, they're doing it to us, which is a great reason for a baby face, let me tell you. Yeah. And, and then Sting says, hey, Flair and I traded the belt several times, but I respected him. And I thought back, I, I could have sworn that 
a hundred times Ric Flair tried to send Sting to the hospital. <laughs> and at least once succeeded. He was out for like six months. Yeah, well. Ric Flair and the horseman kicked your ass, dude. Then we had the blonde interviewing Abyss and Morgan. And the story is that Morgan is lying to him, telling him there will be no weapons in the weapons match. And Abyss said that his therapist told him that if he did good in this match, he'd be a top guy around here. <laughs> Abyss wants to be a top guy. So apparently Vince Russo on Spin Cycle is going to announce that he is Abyss's therapist. Sure. He's the only one who would tell him he'd be a top guy if he did good in the match. Who the fuck else would tell him that? I don't know. Who the fuck would Abyss's therapist know about booking TNA? Actually, more than the writers, but let's take a call here real quick. Who is this and where are you calling from? Hi, this is Rob from Indiana. Rob, what's going on? Oh, not a whole lot. I'm glad I got you guys while you were uh, talking about Impact. Because <laughs> this was one of the worst shows I've ever seen, but not for the usual reasons. <laughs> no, they found there new was, and inventive ways to suck. They found innovative ways. This was the Tommy Dreamer of Impacts right here. <laughs> wow. And, uh... I mean, dead wives references that I don't think you've gotten to yet, but I'm sure there's a lot of more oh, to come with that. Oh, yes. Yes. And uh, I'll just start with the Monsters Ball. The promo that set up this match with the Dudleys, they said any team that wants in, they can join in, and now there's a match to decide one team to go in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. A qualifier for the Dudleys Open Invitation match, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's ridiculous. But much like Tom Co. a couple of months ago, Glamour Boy Shane is easily the best part of TNA right now. We were just talking about that. He oh, is, Shane Sewell. I, yeah, he okay. needs to be he needs to be the next X Division champion. That is absolutely correct, and uh, I agree that he should be every champion as well. <laughs> That's right. That's that was Vinny's line. He is awesome. Yeah, did you see a lot of him in Puerto Rico? I've seen a couple of things he did in Puerto Rico, but I mean, I don't know once he starts wrestling and everything if he'll be, you know, that exciting. I do. But, I mean, for now. <laughs> There's no I, doubt I in my mind. Like in Puerto, I did like him in Puerto Rico, but TNA has this habit of every time someone gets over a couple of weeks, they kill it. Yeah. Well, there's that. Well, I think there the thing he has that. going for him is he's, he's, he's obviously got a very different style, and yeah. his comebacks are just so goddamn great, and I just can't see those not getting over. You know what I mean? Exactly. His comebacks are what professional wrestling comebacks should be. Yeah. They're, they're, they're completely old school perfect I mean, I mean if you're a young guy that wants to learn how to be a wrestler and make a comeback you should be watching shane indeed i am prepared to travel the country to shane sewell matches going crazy for his comebacks and try to get people to follow me if that's what it takes <laughs> i will follow you Vinny. i will follow you there that's good oh, and yeah. uh it also it, it was just crazy i mean with the mick foley promo later on and early in the show with jeff jarrett they did as much time promoting vince mcmahon and wwe than they did their pay-per-view coming up in a few weeks yeah yeah, exactly. <laughs> in, in fact, it's good because WWE didn't do much to promote their own pay-per-view, so thank God TNA did it for them. Hey, thank God Vince Russo is still working for WWE, apparently. <laughs> I mean, really. That's, that's been the rumor, and, and I always shot it down, but sometimes you have to wonder with bullshit like this. But you can't deny it anymore, Brian. It's it's got to be true. <laughs> now, how'd you like the uh, how'd you like the whole storyline with Angle, where apparently he wants out, and they're trying to foil it? <laughs> Uh, it's so ridiculous to the point where I don't even know if that's the real Kurt Angle. I mean, this might be the second Kurt Angle. I mean, for all I know, the real Kurt Angle and Ultimate Warrior are somewhere in Italy just, you know, telling stories of the good old days. But I, this show with Kurt Angle and the UK Sun or whatever paper it was that Jeff Jarrett was reading, it's just stuff that doesn't no make knows. me want to watch TNA. I, 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 we've been bat battling with these same questions all show so far. Yeah, it's. I mean, I don't know if they're ever going to get it. Their ratings stay the same, and people like you and people out there like Dave, they they bring all the stuff up. They just they don't want to listen, and they're defiant to the fact. They're, it's like Vince Russo is going to keep doing it to try and prove somebody wrong, and after ten years, it's not proven anyone wrong yet. Well, it, it is. It, blame Russo. He's he's involved in this. You can hold him responsible. Don't forget, he doesn't own the company. He's not in charge. Yeah, That's there's right. a, there, there are a lot of the people. brain trust. Yes. Yeah, yeah, and Jeff Jarrett had to give the okay to you know approve that uh, Jill Jarrett line. So I mean, there's a lot of blame on him. Oh, we'll too, talk but... about that too. Yeah, there, there's plenty to blame Jarrett about as well. So, well, I want to thank you very much for the call. I very much appreciate it. I'm glad you were able to get through tonight, and and hopefully you can give us a call again. 
I'm sure I will. All right. Have a good night, guys. All right. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, this show sucked. Glad everybody agrees. <laughs> First, read the unanimous. <laughs> All right, so then we had the blonde interviewing. Oh, we already talked about that one. Beer Money came out, and uh, this is the best part of the entire show. Robert Rude's get up. <laughs> we start with Robert Rude. I don't know how to explain it exactly. Well, I, I just want to say, as far as Robert Rude goes, his gimmick is he's rich and he was wearing the cheapest suit I've ever seen. <laughs> yes. It was fabulous. <laughs> then and and uh, James Storm was there. He had a special. Beer holding belt. Yeah. It was like Batman's utility belt with pockets everywhere, and he stuffed them with beer bottles. And if you look close, there were stickers in each pocket that read, I love beer. <laughs> and then Jackie was out, and her breasts were everywhere. Yeah. And so James Storm slapped a dollar bill on them, so the camera had to focus on them. Sure. A great team, these guys. So anyway, they cut a promo burying everybody, and then Team 3D came out, then Abyss and Morgan, then LAX, and finally Cornette said, we're changing the three-way Monsters Ball, we're scratching the match. It's now four-way with the champions involved. So there you go. And I guess they edited out the line where uh, they said there was no competition in the world, and uh, without um, without competition they couldn't make money, and Robert Roode would be sad, and without money they couldn't buy beer, and James Storm would be sad. So at least they took out one line bearing the company this week, although... I don't know why they bother. Well, they should have left that in because it's entertaining. But, but again, that, that, that's an example that they, they only have two hours. They have to cut out lines and dialogue and, 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 and downtime. Beautiful people came out, and ODB announced that her partner was, I swear to God, Rocka Khan. Now, no, I, seriously, who was it? I had heard that Rocka Khan was going to be the partner, and I thought, boy, that should be bad. Little did I know. <laughs> Rocka Khan is the worst wrestler in North America. She made the worst comeback I have ever, <laughs> ever seen in this match. And when I thought that it had reached rock bottom with that comeback, the heels attacked the baby faces after the match. Rocket got the pin, by the way, with a uh, leg drop. And the baby fa- or the heels attacked the baby faces after the match. And I don't even know what Rocka did. Because she... Hold on. It was the hold on. Hold on. Ahead, all right. I can't say she didn't sell. But she didn't sell. But she didn't no-sell. She got kicked, and her response was to not do anything. <laughs> to not move. And she was not, this was not like Hulk Hogan and Sid, for example. It's, uh, Ric Flair and Sid's a better example. It's not like Ric Flair and Sid, where Sid starts giving them the chops, and, and Sid just pokes his chest out or whatever. This girl just had no idea what to do. And she just sat there with her arms by her side, she was getting kicked in the belly, and then she got a little lower... And then she got a little lower, and then she sat on her ass, and that was the extent of her selling. This was bad. She is so much worse than anyone that has ever set foot into Layla Championship Wrestling. I yes, <laughs> by leaps and leaps bounds and, and miles. Leaps and bounds. You fucking were Ric Flair next to this woman. Absolutely. I, I, you know, I was Flair and Dusty Rhodes at the same time. You may have been compared compared to Rock visually John. for sure. <laughs> That's right, indeed. She, she was making this comeback and. Usually when you see shitty wrestlers, they're content to do simple moves in a shitty manner. They'll throw bad punches or horrible f- forearms. This clumsy oaf was doing spin kicks and, like, jumping knee strikes. And she was doing these moves. And they cut to a close-up of her, and you can see the fans in the background. They weren't cheering. They were not booing. They just sneered as if something foul had been placed before them, and they could just tell the reek of it. That, they, they sneered like something grotesque was happening. Was, Place, it was placed before them, and indeed, Rocket Con's comeback was placed before them, and they were offended, as they should have been. You know, sometimes when you have somebody that just fucking sucks, you can just have them sell during the heat, because they just get kicked, or they get slammed, or whatever, and then you let somebody with talent make the comeback. We, we did that with you, me, and Buddy Richie once. We yeah. had a tag match, and they said, who do you want to get heat on? And you looked at Richie, you looked at me, and you said, we'll get the heat on Vince. That's right. And I said, okay. Now, now in this, when I saw Rocka Khan in the corner waiting for the hot tag, I thought, everyone in this company is incompetent, including the agents. However, I must say that when I saw her selling at the end of this match, <laughs> you understood. they made the right decision. <laughs> the worst comeback I've ever seen was better than her selling. God, this was bad. And I should note, while she was the worst part of it, it was not good when she was on the apron. No. They, they, would, bad doing things, they would whip ODB into the turnbuckle, and she would change direction a few times on the way. 
Yeah, they did some stuff. It was bad. Then we had the main event, which was the debut of Mick Foley. It was really cool, actually, to see him come out and see such a big standing ovation. He got a massive superstar reaction, because he's from the real show, you see. Well, I, I, I don't want to... I, I, I hate to bury TNA, because he did get a tremendous reaction, but it really was lame to see 900 people giving him this reaction. You know what I mean? Like, you expect to see somebody come back and just thousands and thousands of people are on their feet going nuts. Here we had less people than ROH puts in the Manhattan Center, yeah. for example. <laughs> yes. Going nuts for Mick Foley. And he came out and talked about some stuff. And thank He, he said it was Man. an honor to be standing in the same room where just a few minutes ago Cute Kip had been. Yeah. And the fans laughed, and then they began to chant Cute Kip. And he laughed. And they got Foley to laugh, so that was great. So he thanked Vince McMahon for making the decision so easy, which led to people chanting fire russo and then angle came out and now he was talking about vince mcmahon and there were more fire russo chants and angle said Jarrett was full of shit to which foley responded well you can't say that on television and then angle did the big promo he said two weeks ago Jarrett said something that touched a nerve quote you told me that i lost everything you're right jeff i did lose everything Jarrett said i lost the tna world heavyweight title he's right Jeff Jarrett said, I lost my Olympic gold medal. He was right. Actually, he was wrong. He got it back, but they've already forgotten their own angle. And it's no big secret. Jeff Jarrett said that I lost my wife. Well, Jeff, I'm not the only one to lose their wife. And there were some people in the crowd that went, oh. And there were some people that went, boo. And there were a lot of people that just sat there. And went, huh? Not no, not anything. It was huh. It was just like, what? Did he just say that? Everyone knows about Jill. They've been talking about it on TV. But the point was, what did this do for the pay per view? Not a goddamn thing. No one watched it. Not a no. single goddamn thing. What did it do for TNA? Made him look like just the slimiest, just the most low rent. And boy, did it make you think less of Jeff Jarrett. Yes, what a fucked up weirdo he is. If my wife died of cancer, hmm, how can I work this into a storyline? And and yes. bring me my pistola. It, it, it's you know what my grandfather said when he was on his deathbed. No, ninety six years old. So on his deathbed, and my dad went down to Mexico to take care of him, and Grandpa just didn't want to be sick at the end, and he said, "Bring me my pistola." Which my father didn't do, but the point is, if I ever have a wife who dies of cancer, and I say, Vince, how can I work this into a storyline in Tulalip? I'll just punch you. Just bring me my pistola. I see. I'll just end it right yeah. there. Yeah. The, <laughs> I, could, I could see people trying to defend this like, well, Jared must have known. Ow. I don't know. But they would say things like, Jared must have known, and I was thinking to myself, that makes it worse, actually, that he okayed this, that he approved it. And he thought it would be okay. Or wrote it. Or wrote it. So that was his idea, maybe. And at the same time, I think, if I'm a TNA employee, and I am told, go out there and make fun of the boss for having his wife die, I'm saying, no. I won't do that. Just think of poor Foley in the ring. You should have seen the look on Foley's face. Yeah. This like, is his debut. What the fuck did I just get myself into? So, here's a company... <laughs> that apparently was not satisfied with putting the sound of crashing planes into a man's music. They wanted to sweep all the, the gold, medal, and bronze for discussing promotional tactics by having a, an actual woman's death, a friend of many people in this company, using that to, to try it, to try somehow and sell pay-per-views. Yeah. Astounding. And here's the amazing thing. He said this line. He said those words. I'm not the only one whose wife has died. Then he turned to McFoley, and they never mentioned it again. No. <laughs> it's just a throwaway Jared, line. Jared never came out? No. Never came out to defend his dead wife? No. This was lame. They threw it out there and then moved on. And what they move on to? I'll tell you what they moved on to. Foley talking about his SmackDown announcing job and Vince yelling in his headset that I'm sure everybody in the Impact Zone was like, what the fuck's this guy talking about? Then he proceeded to name drop 
Edge, Undertaker, Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, Triple H, and John Cena. No joke. Not only did, no, he didn't just name drop them. He talked about how great it was to sit at ringside and watch their awesome, incredible matches. <laughs> how great they were. Yeah. And the reaction for everyone except obviously Cena and Hunter, massive cheers for everyone else. Yep. <laughs> you got sat there thinking, boy, I wish SmackDown was on. And then this all tied in him saying, well, Kurt, you know, you beat all those men. And so maybe you are the best of all time. Maybe the best acquisition in TNA history. And he said, but I'm not sure, so I think I need to be a little closer at Bound for Glory. And Angle said, oh, you want to take Don West's job? May as well. And Foley's like, no, I don't want to take his job. And I don't think they clued Don West in because he was cackling at the desk. He so clearly had not been smartened up because yeah. Foley, he, he did a little tease like, I did not want to take Don West's job. And, and they cut to Don. I think Don feared for his employment. Now, I think Don was just, they, they mentioned that Don was, I think Foley said he's a little overzealous sometimes. And that's when Don was just cackling like, he knows he's a geek. He yeah. doesn't care. That's his job. He's a professional geek. So he was cackling about it. And anyway, it, it led, led to them announcing Foley as a special enforcer at ringside for Angle Jarrett. And uh, okay. there you go. I, I, I'm, Two thumbs down. I'm still Two thumbs not, down. I'm not done Two thumbs down. with this segment. So, yes. So, a, as noted, uh, Angle buried uh, he, he buried Jarrett for letting his wife die, I guess. And then he talked about carrying the back in his company. That's when Mick Foley flipped out. He was so angered. He actually said, how dare you claim to have carried this company in your back? He didn't want to touch the wife subject at all. He wanted nothing to do with that. And I don't blame him. But it still made the whole thing seem even sillier. And then he explains he thought Angle was perhaps the greatest performer he had ever seen. He had beaten everyone. He was so awesome. And Kurt's starting to feel, all right, cool, this guy likes me. He says, I want it close to watch your match. And Kurt's like, okay, you can announce. Kurt uh, Angle says, or Foley says, no, closer. And Angle says, okay, you could be in my corner. And Foley says, no. I want to be the special enforcer. And now Angle's upset. This guy's been kissing his ass for five minutes and talking about how great he is. He was okay with him being in his corner. In his corner. Yeah. But he's pissed off he's going to be the special enforcer. Why? Because they don't know what they're doing. This show was bullshit, everyone. (laughs) This show was an affront to me. This show was directed at me personally. It was much like Alex Alex Shelley's finger, an insult at me, only it was not censored. I had to watch it. It was an affront to God. It was an affront to civility, to humanity, to human decency. I hope you all watched the vice presidential debate instead. Yeah. That had to have been better. I actually hope most people DVR'd it and it didn't record. Yes. To the back! Impact actually was not too bad. It was a pretty good impact, really. Well, it depends on what you consider a Uh, good impact. On a curve. On a curve, this impact was, oh God, it was better than last week. Fuck yes. Compared to last week, this was the best impact maybe of all time. Compared to last week, Brian, this is the best moment of my life. There was, however, some really stupid shit on this show. But it was, it was like just minor stupid shit. Like, like you know that the people who write this just aren't very smart, so you're gonna have some stupid shit in there. But they still did the best they could to make a wrestling show. It opened up with Jarrett and Borash in the founder's office. And he said he knew in three days he had the biggest fight of his career. He hadn't wrestled in three years. Kurt was wrestling full-time all around the world. So it wasn't business anymore. It was personal. He was going to leave it all in the ring. And then Borash saw the gold medal, and Jared said, I have huge plans for it tonight, which I guess we later discovered. Christian came out and said the rumor was he needed to pick a side in the battle. He said he was the champ, and he would pick a side when he wanted to. And this is nitpicking, but I don't care. I'm sick of this man calling himself the champ, okay? He's not the champ. See, that would be He fun. hasn't been the champ in as long as I can remember. It's been a long time. What does that mean, I'm the champ? You're not. You are not the champ. Well, I would so say... stop telling me that. I would say it was a great way to get heel heat, except I don't think he's supposed to be a heel. He's a baby face. As far as I can tell. So it's just confusing. So then out came Booker T, and he tried to talk Christian into getting on his side. And then... Uh, AJ came out and tried to get Christian to be on his side. And they are now claiming that Booker, I guess, is from another country. Africa, apparently. And uh, Cornette finally broke it up. And here's where we got the first real stupidity on this show. Cornette says, well, uh, we have time for one more match here tonight. And you guys are all doing a lot of ta- talking and no one's backing it up. And so tonight it's Booker against AJ. And he said, Christian, I know that you don't have anything to do here, so you're going to be the special guest referee. And uh, 
He said tonight we would settle things once and for all and find out whose side Christian was on. Now, is it me or is Jim Cornette making the assumption that Christian is going to be a blatantly biased ref? Yes. Why else would you say that? If you assign a man to be a referee, and he's a good referee, and he's unbiased, then in the end, there's not going to be a side chosen. Right. No one is going to cross the line. No. You're just... Having a guy referee. <laughs> Cornette was making the assumption that Christian would screw one man. That Christian and he was, was a, he was a proponent of this. That's why he made the match. <laughs> right. Christian, screw one of these men tonight. Right. That's stupid. <laughs> yes. He, he, he wanted an official who would ruin the athletic contest, but at least then you would know what side he was on. Yeah. Yes. While that was stupid, I actually like this segment as a whole, simply because most things on TNA go way, 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 way too fast. Meanwhile, a segment like this on Raw, where they open the show and everyone comes out and, and says their piece, where it's taken like 50 minutes and it gone way too long, this went as long as it needed to go. Went like four or five minutes tops. Each guy, Christian came out and said, I'm on no one's side. And Burger came out and said, be on my side. And AJ came out and said, no, be on my side. And they bickered for a bit. Cornet came out and made the match. And, and they went on. And I thought, wow. That went exactly as long as it should have gone. So way to go, TNA. You actually timed something correctly, which may be a first. Sting the promo and said this match with Joe at the pay-per-view would be the biggest match of his life. His of life. His life. Life. <laughs> well, yeah. hey, you know, they're building up Bound for Glory. Good for them. Said it wasn't about the title or anything. Uh, the entire reputation of Sting was on the line. And he said he was representing people all over the U.S. who had been disrespected. I'm taking a stand, he said. Now I ask you. Is there a single person on this earth who has never in their life been disrespected? Well, me. Really? I get disrespected every time you speak to me. No, so that's my point. So the answer is yes, there's no one. Yes. So he's fighting for everyone. The population of the globe is who Sting is fighting for. Good. He said losing was not an option. He did say that. We had cute Kip against Rhino in a no-DQ match. Velvet Shirt this week said, OMG, STFU. Awesome. She's so amazing, yes. She was plugging John Cena's finisher. That too. So anyway, Kip James, I, I don't even know if I can praise the man, but... <laughs> Give it a try. He's a minimalist. Yes, he, yeah. he was the exact uh, total nonstop action. I guess the the uh, antonym would be total nonstop inaction. Total nonstop stagnancy. Stagnants. That was Kip James. You've never seen a man have less movement in a professional wrestling match until the comeback than this man did. Everybody just go watch this match until the comeback. Yes. Kurt, uh, Kip James did almost literally nothing. I. You could have taken a statue and had the same match. <laughs> he I, he would do like a stomp. And then slowly pace the ring for a bit, and then drop a knee, and then slowly pace the ring for a bit. And then it came time for the comeback when I was watching this thinking, both these guys are two huge men who people don't really realize until they see it in person. And part of the, part of that is because Kip James, particularly when he's selling for a comeback, wrestles like a guy 100 pounds smaller. <laughs> he was running all over the place, taking big giant bumps and flip bumps off clotheslines. And the, 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 the cue for the comeback was Kip James said, give me the bag. And they went to get the brown paper bag, and uh, Kip was going to put it on Rhino, and then Rhino fought back before he could. I wanted Kip to put the bag on Rhino, and then Rhino just completely no sell it. Like, it's just a bag, and then beat his ass. But instead, he fought it off before the bag got put in his head. Sadly, that meant the bag was still in the ring, and I was certain as these guys were running around, someone was going to step in the bag and slip and blow out a knee. Thankfully, that didn't happen. And then by the end, they, they uh, grabbed a table and brought it into the ring and set it up in a corner, and then Rhino got hairspray in the eyes, and Kip Gord, or excuse me, yes, Kip Gord Rhino threw the table for the pin. At which point they said, "Hey, it's no DQ." It was news to me. Actually, they said at the beginning of the match. Did they? Okay, they did. This that's, was, that's it was your fault. It was fine. And then afterwards, the heels were going to beat on Rhino, but ODB and and Raka, she made the save. She apparently is so. A, get this, a hero now. Get this. They saw Raka's match last week at the tapings. And they still went through with this six person. Live! Yes. Rockacon live. Right. That's gonna be bad. <laughs> no, it's gonna be great. Then we had consequences. Oh, we had Borash telling Angle he'd been in Jared's office, he saw his gold medal there. What's Jeff up to? Kurt asked. He said Jeff wasn't gonna sucker him in tonight, he was just gonna sit back and let Jeff make the first move. 
And speaking of moves, we're going to go to the phones. Who's this and where are you calling from? It is LG 1106 all the way from sunny Australia. Oh my God, an Australian calling. Yes, you have quite a few. How about that? We had a we had a folk um, we had somebody from the UK today and we had somebody from where were they? Quebec. And now yes, Australia. Yes, <laughs> wow. So, what's going on? Well, I'm the second one falling through. That's right, yeah. What's happening? Um, nothing much. Sitting at my girlfriend's place eating Doritos. <laughs> You're having far more fun than we are. What kind of Doritos? So you're reviewing Impact. What did you expect? That's right. You can Have you watched Impact or what? What's What's the Impact schedule over like in Australia? Um, I believe it's on at about ten o'clock on Saturday nights here. <laughs> he believes. And, and by the way, what a perfect time for any television show. <laughs> Saturday on his home. It used to be on at Saturdays at eleven o'clock p.m. here. And I think the same amount of people watched it practically. <laughs> Now, so do you watch so Impact there, about LG? people. Do you, do you watch Impact? I try to. I record it and fast forward through about 90% of it. Oh, wow. Well, that's... that's... What, what do you stop for? Who, who makes you stop and hit play? Um, usually the beautiful people. And my girlfriend just chimed in. She believes TNA Impact is shit. <laughs> well, well, she's correct. You picked a winner, LG. So the beautiful yes, people... I believe she's significantly more talented than I'll ever be. Well, that's good. Now, uh, yeah, we're we also big fans of the beautiful people. They're 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 the highlight of the show most weeks. And uh, even cute Kip has has um, I wasn't sure about him before, but he's just awful enough to fit in perfectly. Just enough of a car crash. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And, and superficial, and B- believably say, superficial. Did you say a car crash or a cock rash? Because either way. It works, you know? Well, the show is a bit of a car crash, but I think if you watch enough Impact, you'll probably get cock rash. <laughs> I'm going to describe this show from now on as cock rash <laughs> It really is cock rash Oh, LG, you, you've called from halfway across the world. Any final words before we let you go here tonight? Sorry, what was that? Any final words before we let you go here tonight? Hmm. Tom Cruise was recently deified as the Christ-like figure of the Church of Scientology. I, for one, think this is excellent news. We're ever so much closer to seeing that fucker getting nailed up to a piece of wood. Wow. Holy crap, dude. Now, there was a statement here on the that show. That was a statement. <laughs> I didn't know where that was going, but that was a political statement there in the end of some sort. Oh, well, yes, gee. Thanks for calling there, buddy. We really appreciate it. Not a problem, guys. All right. Talk to you after a while. Later. Australia. And someone who... <laughs> What was so great is that he had to stop and think, and then once he started going, it was he was like a, a preacher. Yeah, he had that speech prepared. Now Nicole Kidman is from Australia, so that that might have been part of the the issue here with the Australians and Tom Cruise. You're saying perhaps this guy had a, had a chance at Nicole, and then Tom Cruise stole her. No, he Tom Cruise shunned her. He did eventually shun her. Didn't she shun him? I forget. That nah, doesn't matter. We'll have to ask the next Australian if if this is a countrywide Tom Cruise hatred. Like it's become here in America is now all of his movies tank because he's insane. All right, where were we? Consequences Creed, Petey Williams and Jay Lethal and the Guru in a number one contenders match. Winner faces the Iron Sheik on Sunday. Fun little X Division four way. There was literally so much action at the finish I couldn't even start to try and explain it. They did one billion moves. Yeah, I, I wrote down the actual finish. Creed pins somebody with a backslide. Guru, I, sure. Don't know. That doesn't really matter. It was fun. I, I, I like the match. It was, there was no point in recapping it. They just they did every move you could possibly do, and it was cool. There, there was one point. I kind of I still can't decide if I love this or hated this. But uh, let's see. PD grabbed. I believe it was Consequences Creed. He hooked his arms behind his back, and Sanjay, his eyes filled with glee, and he got a big smile, and he pointed at Creed and said, "I'm going to punch you." And he held up his arm, his, his arm, and he held up his hand, and he made a big show of pulling off his glove one finger at a time. And this is all a big, slow, dramatic build. And then the payoff was, he just punched him. Yeah. <laughs> I thought he would move and, and Sanjay would hit Petey, or Petey would throw him out of the way and hit Sanjay. No, he just punched him in the gut, and then he kept going. So after the pin in this number one contenders match, it took them literally one second to go to the back. But on the bright side, they went to the back to interview the Sheik who talked about how America had taken his life, had given him a lethal injection. Apparently he's dead. <laughs> oh, no. that's, that's what I got out of this promo. <laughs> he, he, he said that, and, and yes, 
uh, he is a ghost, apparently, and uh, he's passed on. And then he said, they took my wife and family, and I still don't know why or how. I, 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 they got they fired him from WWE? I don't know. And <laughs> they ceased to exist. So then we had an interview with Kurt Angle, or I'm sorry, Karen Angle and Mick Foley. Karen's Angle, as today always says, a very special edition of Karen's Angle. There's never just like your average run-of-the-mill Karen's <laughs> Angle. We're now going to go to a very ordinary Karen's Angle. So she said, I'm just going to let you talk about whatever you want to talk about. That was her first comment, everybody. She's the worst talk show host there's ever been. It took you this long to figure that out? I did that on week one. She dug a new hole and got even deeper. I'm going to let you talk about whatever you want to talk about. It wasn't even a question. She couldn't even say, what do you want to talk about? She just made a statement and then shut up. So anyway, they talked about Foley's debut. and this was This was better in the sense that Foley is a good speaker, and he's the first guest who's ever not yelled at Karen, number one. The problem... And now that now that we've seen one that wasn't horrible, I can tell you all in TNA a problem that I demand to be fixed, like like CM Punk not throwing kicks anymore. Stop editing all this shit. Just it's stop. That's that too. This wasn't as bad as last week where they edited out every moment of silence. However, the the reason they edit these things down is because they want to pack as much information as possible into a minute. The problem is they're so fucking stupid that they don't understand when you try and pack 80,000 things into 60 seconds, nobody remembers a single one of them. More is not better. This is like the most simple, this goes all the way down to the very basics of even wrestling. Keep it simple. More is not better. Yes, that X Division match was fun, but... I guarantee, five minutes after that match, except for the most hardcore fans, nobody knew who won, nobody who knew who was in the match, and nobody could remember any of the moves in the match. So the match was ultimately a failure. It sold out a single buy to the pay-per-view. Got to keep it simple. Foley talked about 8 million subjects. I have no earthly idea what he was talking about. I have no earthly idea. I think they had Joe and Sting last week. That was a big face-to-face, right? Yes. That, Don't that remember w- a single thing they talked about. I just remember the horror of watching it. Not one thing. So just stop, TNA. Yes. Have everybody make two points in 60 seconds. Yeah. Give them 30 seconds to make one point with a lot of silence in there so we can go, hmm, Foley is going to do whatever the fuck he's going to do at the pay-per-view. What could that mean? Then Foley makes a second statement. You could go, let me comprehend that second statement. What could that mean for the pay-per-view on Sunday? Then people might be interested in your fucking pay-per-view. Think of all the great promos Mick Foley has cut. All, 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 all the pay-per-views he has sold. All the asses he has put in seats. Just for the, just for the microphone. And TNA decided they knew better than him how it should be paced. Sure, yeah. They thought he was too slow. Not to mention the fact that it hit me during this that Bound for Glory is Sunday. Yes. Number one, number one, when I heard there was a TNA pay-per-view Sunday, I was baffled. I didn't even know. <laughs> I thought this was a weekend off. No, no, I was no. like, wait a second, there's a TNA pay-per-view this Sunday. Yes. Then it hit me that this is their WrestleMania this, this is Sunday. This their biggest show of the year. Wow. Well, I will say this. I have seen ads for this show on like every sports website I visited to. So they are they are trying to promote it hard. But the ad is just a little, you know, one inch banner thing at the top. It says T and A bound for glory and there are a bunch of men in, in gangster suits. Yeah. <laughs> what the hell? It's Yada all over again. So they plugged the pay per view, it was to the back, Rhino did a promo, said he was gonna gore the whore at the pay per view. What does that mean? Don't know. Practice a way to fuck them. Steve McMichael plugged his refereeing gig at Bound for Glory, which I laughed at. What a weird man. He's, he, he's a kook, yes. But he, he at one point, he was describing the match itself, and he said, it's anything goes. And then, so help me God, in the very next sentence, he said, don't think you can come in and do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. What an amazing mind this guy has. Bear Money, Matt Morgan, Abyss in a non-title match, tag match. Team 3D did commentary. I did love when Bubba said that Mongo was a legit tough guy. You know, Unlike the rest of us fake guys. Yeah. I'd like us, us, We're just fake phony wrestlers. Phony wrestlers here. He's a legit tough guy. They tried the beer money suplex and failed. Morgan. Uh, I love that's his, according to Bubba, that's his name now, which I am fine with. Yeah. 
Bubba Tease, they'd bring some lighter fluid to the pay-per-view, which I'm not a fan of. And Storm tried to use a beer bottle, got thwarted, Abyss hit the black hole slam for the pin, and luckily didn't drop him onto the beer bottle. Yeah, so which is still like, what is this thing TNA has just leaving random objects bouncing around the ring to fall on? I don't know. Paper bags, They don't know what they're doing. That's true. I will say that Bubba Ray on the commentary was pretty awesome on this match throughout. He was very entertaining. He put over all three teams in the pay-per-view, talked about how tough they were, but damn it, we're the toughest, and we're going to settle this on Sunday. So I thought, wow, that was a good job. Blonde interviewed LAX about the pay-per-view. They said they wanted revenge on beer money. This was 30 seconds long and edited. Edited. 30-second interview. Foley did an interview, and he is very great on the mic, and he did a hell of a job trying to build up the pay-per-view. And he basically said that um, he was going to call out each guy, Angle and Jarrett, and uh, going to let them say their piece. He said if anybody tried to run into the pay-per-view, he was going to deal with them quickly and harshly. <laughs> I don't know why that made me laugh, but it did. So anyway, they both came out, and uh, Jeff said, TNA clearly made a mistake in hiring you, Kurt, but that was something I have to live with, and I want you to have something that belongs to you. You've earned this, so I'll see you in Chicago. And he gave him his medals. And it was Angle's turn, and he didn't say anything. And so Foley said, all right, well, uh, shake hands, fellas. And they shook hands, and I thought, that was awesome. And then it was almost over. But Angle grabbed the mic and said, hold on a minute. He said, you did the right thing, and I appreciate that. And could I ask you for just one more favor? And Jarrett said, all right. And Kurt said, I want you to go home, and I want you to tell your three little girls that I apologize. And then he paused, and then he added, because Daddy is not coming home after Bound for Glory. He's going to kill him, apparently. Yes. Now... Last week, Angle made fun of Jill Jarrett, who legitimately died of cancer. Right. This week, he threatened to kill Jeff Jarrett, which seems to be something that is said fairly regularly on a wrestling show. And this time, the announcers were appalled. Yeah. Just appalled. I guess it's because now the children will be orphans. Oh. Is that what it is? But, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what yes. a son of a bitch, said Don. <laughs> he did. He had to censor Don West. Yeah. Which actually it came up again later, but we'll get to that. But, uh, <laughs> yes, l- last week, Kurt Angle mocked Jeff Jarrett for letting his wife die, I guess. And this week, here was Jarrett and Angle face to face for the first time, speaking cordially and shaking hands. Sure. What? <laughs> what was the point of him saying that then, other than to piss people off? I don't know. I, I don't have an answer for you. What bullshit? Borash interviewed Booker about whose side he thought Christian was going to be on. Always these in-depth questions from Borash. Booker, Booker, you're facing Angle tonight, and Christian's a guest referee. Whose side do you think he's going to be on? Mine, Booker announced. Uh, at least when Boris is in an interview, he always, he almost always gets an answer of some kind. When the blonde gets an interview, she usually doesn't get any, 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 any answers, and it's just a waste of time. Because she's a woman. Apparently. Watch Spin Cycle, everybody. You'll find out all, a lot about TNA and women. So anyway, they uh, then he said, he was asked about the briefcase. He said the world would know when the time was right, and the time was coming. I have, I really have no idea what he said here, but Booker T is awesome. Yes. He was, he was just great being Booker T. Roxy and Taylor Wilde against Awesome Kong and Raji Saeed. Fun little match. Miscommunication with Taylor and Roxy as always. And the whole idea was to point out that even though they should work together at the pay per view against Kong since they're both baby faces, well, it's every woman for herself. Yes. They, they, ha- they were having this little match. And uh, the, the announcers teased that later there would be a special clause put into the Samoa Joe Sting match. That was a tease, everyone. Stick around to see what special claws will be in Sting versus Samoa Joe. Mm-hmm. So then they had this tag match, and they get, got the heat, and the babyfaces made a comeback. And, yes, as noted, Taylor Wilde accidentally kicked Roxy in the head. And I thought to myself, okay, now Kong pin Roxy, pins Roxy, and we are all set. No, they kept wrestling. Kept wrestling. They went on. They did a bunch more stuff. Roxy was okay. She made another comeback. And then Kong just hit her with a move and pinned her. Yeah. So why did no one remembers anything except the finish anyway. No one's going to remember Taylor kicking Roxy in the head. They're dumb. That's all I want to say is they're stupid. AJ and Booker with Christian as referee. Good match. Booker got the heat. Christian called it right down the middle. AJ made his big comeback. And anyway, they did a spot where Booker hit a German suplex for the pin. And he was all happy, thinking Christian was now on his side. And Christian ended up throwing his hand down and raising AJ's hand because, in fact, it was a double pinfall spot, and AJ had gotten his shoulder up. So Booker flipped out, and Christian beat the crap out of him. 
And then AJ tapped Christian on the back, and Christian clotheslined AJ. Apparently, Christian was trying to send the message that he was on no one's side. He had just played it down the middle. Or he just hit, maybe he's Junie. He just wants to fight everyone. Cornette could not stand for this. Cornette had signed a match at the beginning of the show where he wanted Christian to be a biased referee to answer this question. Yes. Christian, by being unbiased, made Jim Cornette mad. That's what happened on this show. I'm not making a single bit of this up. I was there. I was there. So, because because Christian would not be an unbiased referee, Cornette got so mad that he signed the men to a three-way at the pay-per-view. And that was that. Two things. First of all, you described the finish exactly as it happened, but they showed it live when it happened, and then never once showed a replay. Of course not. What was a key point here. Of course not. They couldn't... Uh, of all the things he was skipping and, and, and speeding through, they couldn't find time to just show you a replay of this that showed, hey, look, both Ben's shoulders were down, and then AJ got his shoulder up. Because if you weren't paying, if you turn away from the screen, you had no idea what happened. And, and he didn't even really lift his shoulder up much at all. Yeah, and even if you were paying attention, it was also the shoulder away from the camera. So it was not abundantly clear watching on TV what happened. I figured it out because I had been watching wrestling all my life. But, it, it, it again, just a, a, another job of them doing a simple task and doing as poorly a job of it as they possibly can. And afterwards... When, when when Christian, I believe, I believe it was when he laid out AJ, or maybe it just when, when the when the match ended, Don, if that was it, when the match ended, Christian countered three, and then Don West said something, and whatever it was, it was dumb, or contrary to what they wanted people to think, so they had to re-record his line. He 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 said something else, obviously edited in, which just means that what they're booking is so confusing their own announcer can't tell what's going on. Of course not. And then we had the main angle, which was the Sting Joe contract signing, and this was where the show fell apart for me. First off, they announced that the big clause, the special clause that we've all been waiting for, was that there will be no rematch. And Don said, and I quote, that's huge. That's what we were waiting for. And I thought, why? I wasn't. Name a single person that was waiting for that. And tell me why... Let's just pretend this is real. Can you imagine if in the second Tito versus Shamrock match, there had been a no rematch clause? They'd be fucked. They would have been so monumentally fucked. Why would you have a world title match, and it would be a good thing to not have a rematch clause? Well, you, like, think of all the million, especially, especially think about this. <clears throat> if this is real, and you're in charge of TNA, and you've seen that every main event has a million guys run in, bats, guitars, bullshit, blah, 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 ref bumps, fuck whatever. Why would you go, hmm, let's make sure this match, no matter what happens, there can't be a rematch. Stupid. So, and why we're supposed to be excited like about that, I have no idea. So, anyway, then uh, both guys showed up and signed their contracts, and uh, Joe had the line of the millennia. When he said, if Kevin taught me anything, it's that, above all, you be professional. Kevin who? That's what he said. I know. I cried with laughter. Perhaps, Did I not? Perhaps there's no I Kevin laughed I'm not and laughed with. and laughed and laughed and laughed at this line. And so, anyway. Maybe he meant Kevin Thorne. Joe said, I'm a professional. Staying, I do respect you. And he offered his hand. And Sting shook his hand. And Joe headbutted him. And everybody in the crowd goes, boo! Meanwhile, the assholes writing the show thought that he would be cheered. Yes. Now, why would the man be cheered? Not only, not only did he cheap shot the man, he lied! He lied to his face and then cheap shot him. He lied straight to his face, a bold faced lie, and then he cheap shot the man. And, 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 and they thought he would be cheered. And think about the lie he told, by the way. The lie was, I won't screw you. Fucking and morons. And he screwed him. Yeah. Now, 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 if they would have thought, okay, well, this will turn Joe heel, then I'd go, wow, you know, you did it right. Good job. No. They thought this this will be a babyface move for Joe. I just don't understand am, how you could be this goddamn stupid. I am torn between them thinking it would make Joe babyface or if they want it to be shades of gray. No. They thought that <laughs> Joe would be cheered for this act. 
How? I don't know. The best explanation I got was because Joe was getting revenge for Sting hitting him with the bat weeks ago. Are you telling me then that Sting... No, we're supposed to remember. Sting's earlier promo where he said he was fighting for everyone who had ever been disrespected, that was a heel promo? Yeah, apparently. <laughs> Here's kind enough. Of, enough. I have a kind of related question. Looking back, does this mean that, in fact, Sting was handing mysterious black bats to everybody? Yes. Okay. That mystery has been solved. The mystery has been solved. Then they had a Sting Joe pull apart, and, and the show ended, and I thought, there's your go-home show for Bound for Glory. No buys. No, oh, none. Well, I can't say no buys. They did everything they could, but I still can't see all that many people caring about this show. To the back! We have all crossed the line with the TNA pay-per-view, the biggest show of the year, Bound for Glory, was tonight. And what have we got to talk about? We've got to talk about the pay-per-view. We have Vinny here. We have our buddy Craig here, who's going to give his thoughts. And we're going to get Mike Coughlin on the line, who was at the show live in a luxury box drinking alcohol. So he should have a, a very promising review of the show. And there was plenty of alcohol to be had by uh, myself and Vinny tonight as well. So it was a good show. <laughs> It was a good show. Yeah, I had like a dozen shots, I think, of tequila and whiskey. He had three. Craig is indicating three, but I'm sure it was at least a dozen. Yeah, it helped the show. It certainly did. Um, the, the show as a whole, to, to sum it up, there was nothing was bad on it, but it was like one of those old old ROH pay per views where it's just such a breakneck it's such a breakneck pace throughout that you're just exhausted. And then by the end, it was the old school TNA pay per views where it was a really great main event with some garbage at the end. The Kip James match was bad. That's true. That was a bad match. The rest of the show, there was some good stuff. The opener was really good. The Jarrett Angle match was good. The main event was good, although it had a wacky finish. They they uh, saved the Kevin Nash swerve till this show. They couldn't just do it when it made the most sense last month. They had to swerve us on the swerve and then give it to us this month, which is fine. Angle or Nash turned on uh, Joe, hit him with a baseball bat, and Sting ended up getting the win. And, of course, the way they set it up was Sting was going to use the bat himself to win. Mm -hmm. But Nash had to take the belt or the bat away from him. Right. Because, you know, it had to be a swerve. Mm -hmm. Yes. He didn't just let the guy use the bat. No. He took the bat away, I guess, so that Sting might lose. But then he hit Joe with the bat anyway. And then we had the finish. Right. Wacky. Yeah, because if you were if you were Kevin Nash and you wanted Samoa Joe to lose, you would have just let Sting hit him with the bat. But... In, in TNA world, there always has to be a swerve. Was there any shock to this swerve whatsoever? All I know is that Sting grabbed the bat, and then Nash grabbed it away from him, and the crowd booed. And to this moment, I still don't know which guy they were booing. Were they booing Sting for grabbing the bat or Nash for taking it away? I think they were booing Nash for taking the bat away because everybody loved Sting. Now, Sting was supposed to be the heel. This is what I can tell you. Sting was supposed to be the heel... But he got cheered, and he worked as the face, and Joe worked as a heel. And Joe worked him over and was a cocky prick and mocking all his moves. And, yes, Joe was a bully here, which is rare for a baby face. Now, 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 although it was a swerve, it actually does make sense. Why would Nash, the old guy, be on Joe's side? Nash should be on the side of the old veterans. Fair. That makes sense. So, anyway, that was the main event of the show. It was a, it was a good match. It wasn't great. It did have the... Seriously, the dumbest spot I've ever seen. And I, this is on a show on where... this show, mind you. I was ranting and raving about a spot with Abyss and Fire. I saw that and I thought... I actually, I, I think it was uh, was it Messias, Messias, Ricky Banderas. Um, he did a, a flaming table spot in Mexico. And the story was that he had these, these second-degree burns, I believe it was, all over his body from this spot. And I watched it on YouTube and... He gets put through this flaming table, and he immediately falls out of it, and there's, like, no fire on him whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Like, it looked like at no point was the man actually on fire. And I thought, got to be a work. It's got to be a work. He, he didn't really get burned. It's just bullshit. They're making, they're trying to make something out of nothing. So the next thing you know, there's an interview with him in his hospital bed, and they show his back, and he's fucking just covered in burns. Yeah, fire's bad for you. Yeah. So anyway, the point is, Abyss went through this table and was on fire. Yeah, Abyss wrestles... He was on so much fire, in fact, 
that when they brought out the guy with the fire extinguisher to put him out, it took two tries. Yeah, he came out, he, he extinguished uh, Abyss's flame, then he left, and Abyss is still on fire. And so he had to put and him the guy back had to run back out. Here is the great flaw in their plan. There were two great flaws in their plan. One, they doused the table with, with uh, lighter fluid, lit it a flame, and immediately put Abyss through it. As Craig noted, they should have let some of the fluid burn off first. Two, and this is actually the greater error, Abyss wrestles in a cloth suit. So when he hit the flaming table, his cloth suit absorbed the flaming uh, lighter fluid, and thus he was on fire. And I, I should feel bad for him. I don't. So what, He's mind you, dumb. was stupider than that? Let me tell you. In the main event, the first thing they did... Oh, actually, let me get back to Abyss in a minute here. Let me talk about the stupid thing first, because they both tie into each other. Earlier in the... Or very early, in fact, in the Sting-Joe match, they brawled outside and went into the crowd, and they brawled up the stairs, and I'm sure most of you listening to this have been in an arena at some point. The stairs are made of cement. Yes. Not not carpeted stairs like in your house or anything like that. Cement. So anyway, they're brawling up there, and they're on the stairs, and Sting gets knocked down, and Joe climbs up onto, like, one of the He went ramps. into one of the luxury boxes. I thought he might grab a sandwich or a beer. Something like that. So he's standing up there, and suddenly he begins running. And, of course, Sting is, you know, seven, eight feet below, standing on the stairs. He, he's seven feet away and a foot or two down. So Joe goes flying through the air with this missile drop kick and boots Sting right in the chest on the stairs. And how does Joe land, mind you? On his ass. He landed on his back and his ass on the stairs, on the concrete steps. Jumping as high as he could and then landing on ground that was a foot lower from where he started. Everybody imagine just stand on the top rope and jump and do a flat back bump into the ring. I wouldn't do that anyway. Now imagine doing that except instead of landing in the ring, you land on concrete steps. That is fucking what Samoa Joe did. Yeah. Now keep in mind, this guy almost had to take time off about six months ago. Why? Bad back. Hmm. Why the fuck would you do this? I can't think of a single good reason. He didn't get paid a single dime extra. No. In ten years, in ten years, what will Joe have to show for this besides a bad back? Well, nothing. He made no extra money. No. He will make no extra money in the future. Nor will there be any added notoriety. And, and, to top it all off, in both the Abyss match and the Joe match, the Joe match was even stupider. Because the Abyss match, at least that spot came about three quarters of the way into the into the match. True. And this came in the first quarter of the match. The, the Abyss spot occurred three quarters of the way through the match, and we never saw Abyss again. So I had some impact. Joe it hit did? this. Abyss was never seen again. Well, I know. They just kept wrestling, though. Well, at, no at least even... it achieved the fact of eliminating Abyss in the match. Joe hit this dumb move and then just got up and kept wrestling. But, I mean, in both cases, the match just kept going. That is true. And nobody cared. That is also true. I don't true. think the announcers asked a single time, gee, I hope Abyss is okay. Nope, nope. Nope. He he got burnt to a fucking crisp. He crawled underneath something, and we never saw nor heard from him again or heard anyone talk about him. No. The match just kept going. Why would you light yourself on fire for a spot in the middle of a match? Because he's dumb. At least this actually gives me respect for these guys and, like, in uh, IWA Mid-South and, and uh, CZW, you know, most of the time when they do something really damn stupid, at least that's the end of the match. I think when a guy gets chopped up by a weed whacker, that's at least a finish. It's usually a finish, <laughs> or perhaps a near fall at least. Sure. <laughs> this guy got lit on fire, and the match just kept going without him. Yes. Guys just kept doing moves. Right. <laughs> and proceeded to grapple, that's true. Retarded. And uh, neither of these moves, by the way, was there a single replay? No, there was a replay of the fire. There were a bunch of replays of the fire. I see. Yeah. I was. I had some shots. And I think there were several replays of the uh, dropkick as well. So you were wrong there. But uh, still, yeah. still, uh, it was stupid. So anyway, other than that, uh, those two matches were pretty good. Um, a lot of the stuff in the in the hardcore match I wasn't a fan of. Hernandez went on attacks. Got pinned. Beer Money retained the titles in that match. And, uh, yes? Hey, Craig endorses oh, Beer Money winning. Craig, Craig endorses Beer Money. So did we as well. Um, Kindred Spirits on this night. Next Division escaped the cage. 
with a bunch of X Division guys, which was a a fine little match. Uh, I enjoyed it. I gave it three and a half stars. It was all spots. Yeah. This was an example of a match with all spots, but it was still pretty good. And uh, a lot of wacky different things. I ended up with uh, Sanjay getting stuck upside down by his legs. This was in the big red cage with the hole in the top. And to win an X title shot, he had to crawl out the hole. As they noted on the last pay-per-view, you had to escape the tiny hole. And boy, was it something else to see this insane, crazy match. And the winner gets a shot at the guy that won the Bashir versus Creed match that was really nothing special. Which we'll get to later, but yes. This one you had to kill yourself to win. That one you just had to wrestle. Wild Spot Fest. It was good. Two thumbs up for the opener. Yes, it, it, it took a while to get going. For a while, it was just a, I shouldn't say a mess of stuff, but it was, it was so many moves done so quickly, I just couldn't get into it. It was just a, a blur of action. And then there were so many big spots at the end, particularly the, the finish with Lethal and Sanjay Dutt both hanging upside and down from their legs and punching each other in the face like two fighting bats. That part was awesome. And then Lethal eventually got the better of an escape. So a good finish to what turned out to be a good match. Then we had Cornette in the back with the beautiful people and they did a spoof on celebrities who asked for the green M&Ms to be taken out of the dish. They were very unhappy with the color that was left. And they told Mick Foley, who was standing in for Jim Cornette for a while. We never found out where Cornette went in the middle of a fucking paper. Oh, he said he had to deal with the Las Vegas people. Sure. He was talking about their big Vegas show in two weeks for Impact and how he had to go make sure they were happy with what they were seeing. Again, and I asked this on Raw, if you've got to have an important meeting. Why schedule it during a show? 24 hours a day, seven days a week. In fact, I'll even go, at least on Raw, it was just, you know, there's Raw every week. This was TNA's WrestleMania. This is their biggest show of the year. Cornette scheduled a meeting during their WrestleMania. Yes. Fool. Indeed. But anyway, I this segment know, oh. was awesome. Yes, it, and it was great fun. I, I, I do want to know that whoever decorated this office, it was not Jim Cornette. Unless Jim Cornette has a surprisingly large collection of masquerade masks. Yeah. And the best line was when they made fun of Foley's outfit, and then after the girls left, they made the joke about how... My clothes are comfortable, but I'd rather be in velvet. Yes. And then they cackled and gave each other a high five, <laughs> J- J- Foley and Borat. JB said this lame joke, and then Foley made it by pointing at him and laughing as hard as he could. <laughs> and the other time Foley was great here was the beautiful people were upset they did not have blue M&Ms. So they took the M&Ms they did have and tossed them at Foley, who proceeded to catch them in his mouth. Yes. Because he rules. He's a great man. A wondrous segment this was. Beautiful people Kip James against Rhino, Taylor, and ODB. Somebody else was in here. Raka. Rhino, oh, Rhino and Rock in ODB. Wrong girl. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Actually, it does matter, because Rocka sucks. She's horrible. We got to see everybody, for you, those of you who missed the pay-per-view, we got to see Rocka Khan wrestle Kip James. Unfortunately, they kept it very short. They did. They kept but- her out of the ring for 95% of the match. It was merely bad. It was not bad enough to be horrible or even comically horrible. It was just a bad match, and Rhino gored Kip for the pin, and somebody in the crowd noticed that Kip was gay. Yes, there's a sign reading, cute Kip equals gay with the word gay underlined. And all I can think was, boy, nothing gets by you. That's right. You are a sharp cookie right there. The, 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 the highlight of this to me was when, in this bimbo knockout brawl, which I thought meant no DQ, anything goes. And all bimbos. And all bimbos. So in, Rhino and Including Kip, Rhino Kip. and Kip, yes. They got the heat by hitting one of the babyface girls, I guess it would be ODB. They hit her with the makeup kit behind the ref's back. Here Maybe the knockout bimbo brawl was a three-way. I, I, I don't know. I don't care. Then we had Bashir against Consequences Creed for the X title. And long story short, they had a disabled veteran come out to do the ring intros for Creed. Creed was mega over. It was the biggest show of the year. They had the uh, they had the troop introduce him against the terrorist. So, of course, in the end, the terrorist won. Welcome to TNA, everybody. And the crowd was into the match, even though it was a bit sloppy, and uh, that was the excitement. This is an example of how uh, a well-booked match can trump a well-executed match, because this was not Consequences Creed's night. He was jumping late for moves. There was a spot where he was supposed to jump for a crossbody, and the Sheik was supposed to duck. But what happened was the Sheik ducked first, and so Creed jumped anyway, and he was like <laughs> a complete fool. He had a couple other off moments, but... God, the, there were some botched spots there, on the show. Were. But the thing was put together so well with, with the, the evil terrorist getting the heat on Creed and putting him in a sleeper and the crowd cheering the baby face on and chanting USA as he fought back that it all worked so well despite the sloppiness, and then they did their finish. Yeah. Which is the theme for this night, is a, a good match with a bullshit finish. It was even dumber because they did a roll-up with the rope spot, and Creed still kicked out at two. But they were like, that's oh, three! So the ref screwed! The Barbie face in favor of the evil terrorist. 
Then we had the um, Foley backstage. And By the way, uh, everybody go to Google and type in Daivari. And then click on Images. Image search. Yes. And look at some of the pictures of Daivari from WWE. It's comical. He must have bought a Bowflex at some point. Must have. And let me tell you something else, everybody. When Spike goes to HD and we have to see Sanjay Dutt's back in high def. No buys. No buys. No buys. So then we had Foley backstage talking about Hell in the Cell, Jim Ross, and The Rock. So basically they were pointing out how ghetto they were. And then Raisha wanted Foley to give Cornette a message. And the message was apparently that Kong was going to beat up her opponents. This is a very important message she had to spread. And then Foley decided that she needed lightening up, and she said she, he said he was going to call Yerple the Clown. Sure. Yeah. Taylor Wilde, Roxy, and Awesome Kong in a title match. Taylor ended up pinning Roxy with this German. They did a bunch of stuff. Kong actually did a running high cross. It was fine. I didn't, I didn't even get a rating here. I didn't even it write anything down for this match. two and a half stars. I watched the thing unfold, and then I just wrote down uh, who won. I wrote down... Colin was kicked to the floor, and then Roxy was pinned with a German suplex. That's all you need to know. It was just a bunch of stuff that happened in between. Yeah. There was no flow to it. There was no story. AJ did a promo. Team 3 walked in, called him a mark for liking Mick Foley. They talked about WWE and ECW. And then they called Foley Cactus Jack. Ghetto. Biggest show of the year for the number two company. That's what this screamed. Then we had uh, Cornette finally returning, and Foley told him nothing happened when he was gone, and Cornette was happy. That was that. Monsters Ball, we talked about this. Steve McMichael was the guest referee. Let me tell you something about Steve McMichael. First off, enormous. I thought it was Tom Lycus at first. I thought it was the Michelin Man. <laughs> a, a giant, a giant, he's like a he's like a, a square with rounded corners, is what he is. With tiny arms now, and an absurd haircut. <laughs> he's parted right down the middle with his glasses. And I thought, first off, they didn't play up big enough that he's a former horseman. They really should have. But... I thought, okay. Oh, right after you mentioned the, that would just make them look ghetto, wouldn't it? No, come on. Horsemen? Seriously. <laughs> this, this company is still part WCW. Well, alright. It's an offshoot of WCW. Anyway, the point is they, um, McMichael is, is out there and I thought, Mongo, referee, six men, Eight hardcore. Men. Eight men. Eight men. This will be a disaster. It wasn't. And in fact, Mongo saved the match. Yeah, the spot of the match involved Mongo. That's definitely true. Because that, well, no, there was that spot too. But after all of the bullshit in this match, uh, Hernandez, who at one point had given the seven foot, three hundred twenty pound Matt Morgan a border toss, this gigantic strong man couldn't open up a bag of tacks. <laughs> and Mongo, right. Mongo finally says, "Give me that." And he opened it up and spread him out on the table. Yes, the referee helped the rest to spread the tax on the this table. This would never happen at WrestleMania. How could... <laughs> they tied the bag of tax in, in, in a knot in so any tight. In company with a clue, they would make sure the bag would be able to be untied. Yes. This place is so back-ass words, and they make sure to tie this bag so tight that Hernandez can't open it up. <laughs> yes. So Mongo opens it up and pours it all over the table, and Hernandez goes through, and that was that. And um, The highlight of this match, again, was somebody with a sign that said, Fail with a teal day bang. That's all it said. And that was a victory. Win. Vince is going to talk about that. Yes, there, there was a... I don't understand football, so I would have called it a hike. There was a hike involved. Yes, that's correct, Brian. You use proper terminology. <laughs> it, 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 it came out at one point to beer money alone in the ring with I'm Mongo. I'm going to have to call your show next week and ask about it. What, what a hike is? Yes. Sure. So uh, James Storm, he came out for this match. He was wearing a, He's wearing the baseball hat with the beer bottles on the side and the, the tubes were into his mouth. This year he upgraded to a football helmet. Or excuse me, this week he upgraded to a football helmet with the uh, beer bottles on the side and the tubes going into his mouth. So... At some point in this match, it came down to beer money alone in the ring with Mongo, and they decided to challenge him. So Storm put on his football helmet, and they got, grabbed a football from somewhere, and Storm went into a three-point stance and grabbed the ball like a center, like he was going to hike it. And uh, Rude stood behind him like a quarterback, ready for the snap. And Mongo looked confused, but thought, all right. And he got down like, a, like the defensive lineman he was, and he squared off across from Storm. And uh, Rude reached over, and he slapped Storm in the ass, and... Storm hiked in the ball, and Mongo immediately hit a, used a swim move to get past the blocker, and he found himself facing the quarterback 
Rude, who stood there with the ball, not knowing what to do, and so Mongo clotheslined him. And this is so fucking awesome, mainly because I don't know what Beer Money's plan was. <laughs> I don't know what they hope to accomplish with this tactic other than getting Bobby Rude clotheslined by the ref. Their plan was to be awesome, and they succeeded. Their plan was to be awesome, and it ruled. Storm walked out. When he walked down the ramp at the beginning of this match wearing that helmet, I just I said out loud, I hope someday, or I, I wish I was as cool as James Storm. And you both reminded me I am not and I never will be. And that no. made me sad. <laughs> what can you do? I can't deny it. I can't argue with you, but it still makes me sad. I have feedback here from Matthew. It says, like, the subject line is bound for glory, period. There's a period after it. <laughs> and the entire email reads, and nothing is capitalized, not exactly a good WrestleMania, and then a frown. <laughs> There's your feedback, everybody. <laughs> Death analysis. There's also a point that here. It's so much funnier to read than it was to announce. <laughs> it was. It was Monsters Boss. They had all sorts of weapons, and Homicide broke out the ghetto fork, which they zoomed in on as he, I believe it was Devon who was attacking with it. He basically slapped him with the back of the fork repeatedly, yeah, and they, they zoomed in he, on he it. He whacked him with the, the safe side of the fork, and so, of course, they got a close-up. Yeah. And I thought, you know, WWE was, was worried to death about HD. They thought everybody's going to look very old. Everybody's going to have to hit each other a lot harder because otherwise it's going to look fake. And there was absolutely no difference whatsoever. It all ended up fine. TNA and HD is going to be a disaster. A disaster. This is the worst director I've ever seen anywhere. Well, well, he had a a number of moments tonight wherein people would set up a move. The the one that comes to mind uh, was Christian and AJ and Booker. And AJ was doing his his dropkick spot, and uh, Booker got dumped over the top rope. And I immediately thought to myself, okay, now Christian will turn around and get drop kicked. I knew this. The director, who's been directing TNA now for years. And WCW. And WCW still hasn't figured this out and cut to Booker on the floor doing nothing. Yeah. There, there how, were times, how can you direct a wrestling television show every week and not learn what to show? There, there were times during the show that the heat was missed. The yes. spot to set up the heat was missed. Yeah. Fools. There was a point during the show, the, during the opener, where with ten X Division dudes killing themselves in a cage, we were looking at SoCal Val. Yeah. Well, she did look the best she ever has. Fine. <laughs> Booker T, Christian AJ, in, and I quote, a 3D war. They did a bunch of three-way spots, and then Booker hit an axe kick on Christian off the top for the clean pin. So apparently they feel that Christian is going back to WWE for sure. And why would anyone not, having uh, put over WWE to such a degree for the past two weeks? It seems absurd that your contract would be up and you would stay at this point. After all, Kurt Angle wants to leave, and the storyline is they're not letting him. They are attempting to prevent him from being marketable and valuable to WWE. Yes, they're trying to bring down, the story his, bring down his marketability and his star power. That's what they've said. Like Those are their exact words. Right. I'm going to make sure, what did Jared say? I'm going to make sure that Vince McMahon doesn't want you, or, or what do you say? I'm going to make sure that Uncle Vince doesn't even want you back. That's right. Uncle Vince doesn't even want you back. Thanks, Greg. Jesus. All right, then we had the Angle promo and then the Jarrett promo. Jarrett was weeping. Borash basically asked, what will happen during this match if you die? That was almost his exact words. Yeah. He said your, he said your, your, your daughters are at home. Uh, he didn't, he didn't say your wife is dead, but he said, you know, what's going to happen if, if something, something happens? If something were to happen yes. during this match... What happens to us? And Jared was weeping. He talked about all the pain and agony he had felt in the past two years and and, and said he was doing it for those three little girls. And he looked at JB sternly. And then he reached out and grabbed his guitar and went to the ring. So corny. Back up. Angle and Jarrett with Foley as the enforcer. Foley didn't do anything for 95% of the match. They had a good match. Jarrett looked great for being Jarrett on for two years. Jarrett looked awesome, actually. Yep. I, 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 he looks so good that I hope he wrestles on every pay-per-view. Yeah. I'm saying that right now, everybody. We'll see what happens in three months when he's still hitting dudes with the guitars and there's a hundred ref bumps. But for this match, it was very good. And, um, the finish made me irate. Um, and it wasn't actually for the actual finish. It was, it was fully, Angle went outside to get a chair and fully tried to stop him. So Angle, Swung this chair like a fucking baseball bat and just walloped him right in the side of the head. Brutal. Brutal. everyone. Yes, once again, taking brutal chair shots to the side of the head. Then he got in the ring and did the exact same thing to Jared, who also didn't block it. Now, I realize it's the biggest show of the year, and and I guess in some ways you can't fault these guys because they are old fuckers who have been in this business forever, and this is how it used to be. But it's 2008. Every single person watching this knows it's fake. 
you're not going to convince anybody it's real by getting hit in the head as hard as possible. Why not just block it? Just put your damn hands up. Why not just block it, though? What are you proving by taking this as hard as you can? All I think now is that in 2008, people see you doing this, and they think, what a dipshit. You know, maybe your average fan doesn't. I probably shouldn't draw a comparison between TNA and Tulalip Championship Wrestling, but last night I watched the TCW champion, cha- cha- Championship change hands, and the finish was a chair shot where in the chair had like a four-inch cushion on it, and the guy still put both hands up. And, and the crowd's still went crazy. They, yes, I'll actually bring this up. It was Caden Matthews. Caden Matthews against uh, Chris Reisick with Bolo of SmackDown fame. The, the man who was so smart that he got out of the ring before the Kali match. They, uh, he was a referee here. And, um, and yes, um, there was a chair shot with a padded chair. One of those, and it wasn't even like the, 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 it was like, there was like four padding. inches of foam, uh, a foam cushion and then cloth on top of it. Yeah. He, he whacked Ryzik with this cloth chair. Ryzik took a bump. Caden made the cover. Bolo counted the pin. And am I joking? I have never seen a bigger pop in Tulalip. No. Not even when Eugene came out. No, people were This was a this. bigger pop than when Eugene came out. I've been to every show. I've worked every show. When Caden got the pin, everybody stood up. And they raised their hands in the air, and they cheered, and they went like this. A padded fucking chair shot with the guy putting his hands up. Both hands. Yeah. And here's and here's a fucking Foley baseball. and Jarrett taking chairs right to the side of the head, like swung like uh, Ryan Howard and, and just suffering perhaps severe brain damage for nothing. For no, Literally for nothing. So anyway, that was that match, and... And, uh, it was it was the old school. Like I say, this is what TNA was for years. A really really great main event with a really really stupid finish that made made you feel angry. You wasted your time getting emotionally invested in it. I mean, for most of this match, it was actual wrestling as opposed to the stunt show we had seen for the prior two hours. It was guys working submissions and selling them and selling pain and selling uh, 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 exhaustion and fighting through it and making big comebacks. And it was awesome. And they did their wacky screw job finish they always do, as they did in both other main events on the show. Craig, do you have any comments here? Now that we've we've recapped all the matches, what you thought of the show in general? The show was fine. Um, I was uh, put your mouth right by that. I'm sorry. There you go. Wow. Anyway, uh, the show was fine. It um, the the Jarrett and uh, um, um, all right, enough about you. Here's yeah, my no, question. No, no, it was good. It was all a right. good. That match was really good. Jarrett and uh, Angle. Angle, thank you. And uh, the. Uh, Sting and Joe match infuriated me because I didn't know who was babyface and who was a heel. No one does. And it made absolutely zero sense. Joe might be the stupidest man in wrestling, um, but the rest of the show was good. Now, you came over for this. I know. <laughs> I, I, I walked in a well, minute or two. Hold on. Let me say one thing first. Okay. okay. I went to a seminar today, and I was I was gone from noon to 3. And I came out to my car at 3 I had four missed calls and a voicemail. Were they from me? And I thought, who the fuck called me four times? And I look at the screen, and it's Craig. And no offense, Craig, all right? This has nothing to do with your weight. But after seeing four calls from you and a voicemail, I thought, I hope something bad didn't happen. And, like, Craig is calling me from the hospital. This is actually what I thought. What is that? Why would this man call me every hour on the hour and leave a voicemail? What does that have to do with my weight? Well, maybe he had a heart attack. You never know, Craig. Suck it. (laughs) I'm just, this was my thought. I was, I was horrified because I was like, why would Craig call me four times? So wait. Or maybe you, maybe you got in the fender bender. Or maybe that thing on the bottom of your car. And he, while having a heart attack, called you. Well, maybe, you know, he was fine. Maybe it was a scare. I wanted to see TNA's answer to WrestleMania. But hold on, I'm not done yet. (laughs) So I called you back. Right. And you answered the phone, and I said, Craig, you called me four times. What's going on? And you were like, I want to know what time the pay-per-view is. What time are you guys reviewed. watching it? Yes. And I said, five, when it, right. when it airs live. And you were like, oh, okay, well, uh, I'll give you a call back. <laughs> that was like the extent of this conversation. I was... And I thought, you called four times on the hour and left a voicemail, and that's the conversation we I had? I was engrossed in football There's at more. the time. So I hung up, and I thought, what a geek. Because you did this last night, too, with yes. Tulalip. The, the you know exact Joe same Tulalip. thing happened for Tulalip. Craig, Craig called me at 4.30 and said, what time are you guys going to Tulalip? No, let me recreate this conversation, too. <laughs> so Craig calls me, and he's like, are you guys going to Tulalip? And I said, sure. And there's a pause, and he goes, that's a long way away. <laughs> and I said, yes, it is. I'm not going to get you. And he goes, I know. And I said, 
what are you saying then? And he goes, I don't know, maybe I'll be out there. And, of course, you weren't. No. Well, so, hold on, he, hold on, hold on. After that, there was more. After that, he called me. It was 4.30, I was at REI. He calls me and says, what are you doing? I'm shopping at REI. You guys going to lay up tonight? Yes, we'll leave about 6. So if you if you leave in about a half hour, you'll be right on time. Well, I might go. Okay, call us and let us know if you're coming. Sure. 6.05 rolls around. Craig is not here, so I call this house. His lovely wife answers. Hi, is Craig there? Yes, he's mowing the lawn. Mowing the lawn. Mowing the lawn. Not calling us and say, I'm not coming. Sure. So anyway, the, 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 to defend myself. Hold on, hold on. Let me to defend myself. Let me, let me conclude no, the story no, let first. Let me finish. Let me conclude uh, the story first. Hold okay. on. I got to conclude the story first. In conclusion, after all of this, at 4:55, I looked out my window and I saw Craig getting out of his car. I fell out of this chair. They literally slid back, and I went like this out of my chair, which of course nobody can see. This radio. But I did. And you came here for this pay-per-view. So to conclude, what compelled you? Oh, sorry. I, I, I walked in like at 5.03. I was late, and Craig was in the chair. My exact words were, Craig, what are you doing here? <laughs> Absurd. Okay, listen. Uh, I don't have to work tomorrow. I have the day off. My wife is having surgery tomorrow. Carpal tunnel sur- surgery. She'll be fine. But um, I don't have to get up tomorrow, and I thought, what better way to kill three hours? Actually, four or five hours, because I have to drive here and back. Normally, I can think of a lot better ways, but I well, understand your point. Yeah, so here I am, and and uh, I had a good time, and I was playing bartender this evening, and everybody's happy. A so. good time was had by all. Don't Abs- get me wrong. Absolutely. I, I was just shocked that you showed up for this show. So well, maybe this did a better buy rate, everybody. Maybe wives around the country were having carpal tunnel syndrome uh, surgery, <laughs> and tons of people showed up to watch the show. I'm thinking not. All right. Now, hold on a second, everybody. We're going to get Mike Coughlin here on the line, who was in a luxury box drinking during the pay-per-view. Do you need and, me still? Uh, hold on. We'll, we'll, we'll interview him very quickly. We're not going to run over the entire show. I just want some brief thoughts. So hold on, and let's call him. And we've got Mike Coughlin here on the line, who was live. He crossed the line. He was at Bound <laughs> Glory with our good friend Jay Bennett, and I believe, as you said, a luxury box with liquor. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know what happened. Jay Bennett, like, I, I, uh, I show up at his house. And we were just gonna, I thought we were just going to, sh- I just got, just something happened in my car. Uh, I just showed up and we are going to drive to the arena to pick up tickets because, you know, it's TNA and nobody's going. Sure. And he goes, I got a surprise. And we show up and he's got somehow he secured a suite with all I could eat food and liquor. You but bastard. There's food for miles. I had plates of just nothing but cake. So it's like, Angel food cake and chocolate cake and cheesecake and I just piled it high and I eat it and I throw some of it away just to be caught in this. It was wonderful. <laughs> wow. You had a better time than we did. So so what do you think of the show, Coughlin? We already ran down all the matches, but let's get a, a general recap of this program from you. Well, as somebody who hasn't seen the TNA uh, show all the way through in, I don't know, since December or something, I really didn't know what was going on with a lot of it. Yeah. Uh, but we don't the Chicago crowd seem really into everything. That is true. Um, there's a lot of wacky things. I will say that live, while everybody loved that cage match, I thought it was ridiculous because I couldn't see anything. Yeah. Like the, the bars on that cage are so thick that, I mean, I, uh, granted, I was up a little higher, but I could not tell what happened at all. I would just see guys fly around in the ring and land, and I'd go, well, somebody got hurt on something. That's what looked like on uh, TV, too, pretty much. Yeah, and but the like the, I thought that the three way was phenomenal. I loved that, and uh, yeah, I, I assume Samoa Joe's a heel, and he got booed like I couldn't believe it. People really hated him, like it was ridiculous. Don't, don't they have the big screens like uh, WWE shows where you can see what's going on if you can't see what's in the ring? Well, it's funny you should mention that because uh, Josh and I were talking about that. They had these two big screens it said TNA Bound for Glory. And, which is funny because I thought the name of the paper was actually crossed the line. That's the only thing I could see. But they, it would just say Bound for Glory on it, and they weren't having a live feed to it for a while. And then it would come and go. It was intermittent, the feed to the big screens, which was kind of odd. So, But eventually we found out how to get the uh, show on the box, on the TV inside the box there. Uh, but by that time, I'm like, I didn't really care that much. Well, you know, it's just one of the uh, wacky spots. and it was kind of crazy, and I, it was kind of odd. Like, these guys do these giant moves, and people are going crazy, 
and then they just kept doing more moves. And everybody's like, <laughs> no they shit. wanted to cheer, but they didn't know when they were allowed to cheer because they wouldn't stop doing things. But uh, that was crazy. How was the attendance? I would estimate it at about 5,000. The place holds 12. I've been there before for the IFL. Um, they had the entire lower bowl was pretty much set up, but every single seat in the upper bowl was empty. Like every single one of them. There was not one person sitting up in the upper deck. Uh, and there was only one balcony there. So about but, half uh, you know, It was, uh, it was a lot, like there was a lot more people than there were actually there. I mean, was, they've got great acoustics in this place. Uh, you know, like I said, I, I was there for IFL and you don't hear this said very often about TNA, but they came across with so much more major league than the IFL did when they were there. <laughs> wow. It seemed like a real high praise. Like real, yeah, it seemed like a real professional prop the entire time. Okay, now that now, did not translate to TV, by the way. Craig, yeah. Craig kept looking at the screen, saying, "Is this really their production value?" <laughs> yes. Now, now, two quick questions about spots. There were two spots that that just were phenomenally terrifying on this show, and I want to ask you about them live. The first, obviously, is Abyss going through the flaming table. That was, uh, I'm, you know, we kind of knew it was coming because I guess Bubba Ray said he was going to set someone on fire or something. But when they actually did it, I mean, I, I've seen fire spots before. I've seen them live at ECW shows and stuff. But uh, this was crazy because Abyss just caught on fire. Yes. And I'm watching going, I don't think he's supposed to be on fire for that long. Yes. Like, they, like they sprayed him with the, the fire extinguisher, and then they just, Braid him again and again and again. You can see it just look a panic on the uh, fireman's face or whatever. Like, oh shit, this guy's gonna die on TV here. But uh, people definitely reacted to that. But at the same time, they didn't react to it with it was near as much fervor and excitement as you would probably expect from watching a man just get set on fire on pay per view. And then the other the other horrifying spot was when Joe was on the uh, on the ramp or whatever you call up there on the uh, luxury box or whatever it is and. He did the flying fucking drop kick and landed flat on his back on the steps. That that got over a huge live. Like that was kind of below Josh and I's seat, and so we didn't really see it, what happened at first. But we just heard everybody go nuts. So we looked up, we looked at the TV screen in this suite, and we saw the spot. And I'm just looking at it going, this is unbelievable. This man just took like a giant like eight flat back bump on concrete, and I don't know what he was trying to do. But it sure as hell got people going. That's for damn sure. Well, that's good at least then. The one positive about it. So, so uh, any other Empire members there? What did Jay Bennett think of the show? And do you know who had the sign that said, Fail with a Teal Day Bang? Uh, no, I have no idea who else was there. I, I believe that uh, same person had a sign that said, Bias with a Teal Day Bang. <laughs> it to be crumbly. Yeah, the only sign I saw was a guy that had the giant sign that said, Call me, and had his phone number on it. That guy got on TV, but he was so dumb, he was holding the sign too low, he couldn't read the number. Damn it, I would have called him here on the air. It just said, God Call me, it. and then just symbols. But but, we were all watching that, and I would go, That guy's crazy, and Josh goes, He probably put someone else's phone number on it. And I realized that would be the greatest rib ever. Well, who did that? Somebody did that to uh, Al Snow's phone. Or Al, Al Snow did it to, was it Bob Holly? Al Snow had, if you've seen my dog Pepper, call this number, and it was, oh, it was Val Venus. It was Val Venus's cell phone number. You know, Crumbly actually sent me an email when I was gone and said, call me before such and such a time if you want me on the show tonight, and I didn't have time to respond in time. Maybe that was him and his number. <laughs> could yeah, be. It could have been. <laughs> what a but, great show. Uh, I mean, overall, I said, I mean, it was, a, it was a really entertaining show, I felt, from my like, top to bottom. I mean, again, I say this to somebody that doesn't watch TNA. Uh, I haven't watched an entire episode of Raw all the way through in months. I mean, I watched and I fast forward through this and that. But, uh, I mean, I liked what I saw. There was a lot of variety of stuff. Um, I thought it was telling that it seemed like the matches people enjoyed the most were the Great wrestling matches involve like one or two or maybe three people. Amazing. These multi-man schmazes just didn't seem to really do that for too, too many people. So overall, a, a thumbs up. Yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. And, I, and I, I admit, I was drunk for the first half of the show, so that kind of helped a lot. But uh, I sobered up for the rest of it. And when I was sober, it was really enjoyable also. So <laughs> thumbs up to TNA. Well, Mike, I want to thank you for doing the show today. I really appreciate it. I'm glad you had a good time. Yeah, me too. It's uh Wow, really crazy night there. I was in a suite watching TNA, and uh, the best part is I, Josh and I think we figured out that TNA doesn't get any money off the suites because they're sponsored by somebody else. So, P Plug your show real quick before we let you go. 
Oh, yeah, Five Star Radio, you know, that uh, MMA show. Where, uh, I, I will have a show up this week previewing uh, the UFC uh, with an 89 from uh, England, headlined by uh, Bisbing versus Chris Lieben, with the undercard match of Brandon Vera versus Keith Jardine. We're supposed to take a decent little show for free on Spike TV, so I will have a, a big old preview of that in the next few days. All right, well, thanks again for doing the show, and I will keep in touch. All right, Brian, I'll talk to you guys later. All right, see you. All right, bye. Well, how about that? A positive live review. Everyone loved the show. Vinny, Craig, any final thoughts before we wrap it up here with you two? Uh, two thumbs up for Bound for Glory, believe it or not. Craig? No mercy was way better. <laughs> well, that's undoubtedly true, but that's fine. What can you do? We were there live for that one, so. To the back! Let's talk about impact and get okay. the show over with. Boy, did this show suck, everyone. <laughs> no, seriously. The show didn't make me mad in, like, the normal way that the show... Well, there were a couple of things that made me really mad. Like, um, this this big announcement that Mick Foley was, was uh, quitting, you know, after three weeks he was retiring. It is explanation for it, by the way. But uh, what really pissed me off about this show was... It's like it's like those old. Remember, we would watch like Raw, and people would say there were 29 minutes of of wrestling or 19 minutes of wrestling in this two-hour show. Mm-hmm. No way, we got 19 minutes of wrestling on this Impact. There were two matches in the entire first hour, and I'm sure one went about three minutes, and the other I think went about two or three minutes. That's six minutes in the first hour, and the Matt Morgan match was a little bit longer. But if we if we hit 19 minutes on the show, I would be stunned. So if anybody has yeah. the uh, I, I would actually take the over on that bet, but not by much. There was, there was for certain more wrestling. There may have been more wrestling in the Chavo and Evan Bourne match than on Impact, and there for certain was more wrestling on ECW in their two matches than in the five we got on Impact or whatever it was. Bad. And it's not like the, was, the, the, the time was filled with great comedy or dramatic skits or, or fantastic video packages. No, it was filled with the usual crap. I said that uh, Foley would be saying goodbye later. Didn't explain why. They just said later on, Foley's going to say goodbye. Before that, they, they were showing highlights from Bound for Glory. They showed Abyss going through a burning table. They said, he is burned, he was hospitalized, he's released, he's not here. And they moved on. That was how fast they went for a man set on fire. Yeah. They didn't care. <laughs> they don't care. No. And why should anyone watching care? We had uh, Motor City. Oh, then we had Jared also, who mentioned that he had exclusive comments from after the pay-per-view. He said he was done wrestling. So, yes, there are two guys... Well, one guy making his pay-per-view debut for TNA and Mick Foley, and one guy making his pay-per-view return and Jeff Jarrett, and both guys, after their appearance, were done. Yeah, just he, finished. They had the same crappy storyline they recycled twice in the show. I don't know. Motor City Machine Guns against uh, Sheik Bashir and Sanjay Dutt, the evil foreigners. Uh, Sanjay and Saban actually fucked something up royally early on, and then Sanjay did a wacky dance, and that saved it. That saved the entire match. Yeah. So the machine guns won. They just beat Sanjay clean. And then afterwards, Kurt ran out and beat the shit out of everybody. This was straight out of WCW. It was. All I could think was, hey, it's Scott Steiner. Yeah, just beat all the guys up. And then uh, it cut a promo saying that nobody beat him and then walked away from wrestling forever. Said Jarrett needed to be ready for a major war. Wanted to know if Jarrett was a champion like him or a candy-ass hick from Nashville. Said he was going to kill all the TNA talent one by one until it was just the two of them. And then said he would get back in the ring, but until he did, all the bloodshed would be on his hands. Yeah. And his promo for sure went as long as the match did. So there you go. Yes, that, so that, that's the key. Uh, there, was a, there was a quick match. It may have been fun, but it doesn't matter because Kurt Angle killed all four men. Yes. Yeehaw. I thought we had somebody, then they hung up. I was going to go immediately to them, in fact. <laughs> I just need some. <laughs> you already tired of talking about impact? I don't know. I, I'm, 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 oh, you want to test the thingy? I'm obsessed with this this thingy here. So, um, and by the way, if anybody knows anything about uh, digital hybrids, please email me. Um, <laughs> save us. Just please save me. I've got a digital hybrid and a a, a mixer here with Cubase, which fucking sucks, but it's uh, the best I can do. So. Anyway, then we had uh, um, Borash interviewing Nash, who said that uh, that he came first at this point, and it was Kevin Nash for life. I'm not sure how that's any different from his usual. <laughs> for the past 15 years we've seen of this man, yeah. he uh, climbed out of the car, and JB says, boy, we were surprised to see you at Bound for Glory. And he said, surprised? Someone bought, paid, for my pay, paid for my plane ticket, because, of course, he doesn't fly himself anywhere. No. So he was there on business, and then he was, this is where he said that he was mad at Joe because of what Joe had said 
ten months ago burying his friend Scott Hall. And Sting came out and cut a promo and said he knew it wasn't supposed to be him standing there as a champion. It was supposed to be Joe. Everybody booed. Every time Joe's name was mentioned, they booed. Yes, they did. This company is so dumb. And then he said Joe was the better wrestler at the pay-per-view and the better wrestler in general. He booed this. Yeah. And he had uh, taken him during the match to places he'd never been before. And uh, anyway, he said that Joe had him beat 10 minutes into the match, but instead chose to do what he always did, and that was mock him and his generation. And I thought... Is there a spot in this match I completely missed? <laughs> what in the hell is Sting talking about What here? in the hell was he talking about? Was there a bit where Joe hit like a muscle buster and pulled Sting up a two? Because I don't remember that. I don't remember it. Or, or anything like that. Or, or, or had him in a choke and the ref dropped his arm twice and then Joe just let go? May have been. I don't remember this. I don't remember I don't remember this having a match. So, oh, we have a caller. <laughs> it's quick. Drop what you're doing and go to the, go to the phones. Who is this and where are you calling from? Oh, shit. I had the wrong. I was looking at the wrong light. We don't have a caller. False alarm, everyone. That fucking broke my heart right there. I turn off some of these diodes. Should be sunglasses you can wear so you see the lights more clearly. Turn off those two right there. See if that helps. All right, uh, where were we? So anyway, yeah, he said uh, he was ranting and raving about respect and disrespect, and the people were cheering him. I have no idea what he's talking about. I mean, I literally have <laughs> no idea what he was talking about. And it's always like this in these promos. His delivery was great. What he said made. Dirt, no sense. So then AJ came out and said that uh, he'd been friends with Joe for a long time, and if Sting had just listened to what people said, he'd be respected. People were now booing AJ. And he said if Sting didn't belittle them, he wouldn't be belittled in return. I have no idea what he's talking about still. I, I don't know when Sting belittled anybody. Started talking about this, that, and the other thing. And, and he said he's talking about Sting being the guy who came in once, uh, once a week to get the big paycheck and then go home and... Try to talk about how the people who built this company were men like, and I am not making this up, Loki and Chris Daniels. Yeah. <laughs> one of whom is legitimately not with the company anymore and has not been for a long time. The other one in storyline has not been around anymore. So why he's promoting those two, I don't know. Mystery. It was a great mystery. This whole show is a great mystery. So anyway, then we had, um, oh, and oh then, they, then they started talking about. Oh, I how this ended. Yes. Yeah, Sting... God, this sucked. This is a horrible promo now that I think about it. So then Sting starts talking about uh, how. AJ told him once that he didn't like how his dad brought him up, and he didn't like the example that his father set. And he said that uh, if he basically said if AJ kept making these choices, he turned into his dad. Now, where the fuck did AJ's dad come into this? <laughs> I've been watching TNA for their entire six-year existence. I don't recall the father of AJ Styles ever coming into play, unless he was there in that one wacky skit they did where he locked himself in his room and JD went to go see the family. I certainly don't recall AJ talking about his dad bringing him up the wrong way. I have no idea what he's talking about. This is something they made up for this promo here, and I guess we're supposed to buy into it now and believe it, because they just start talking about it now. I thought AJ's dad was Vince Russo. Must have been a different storyline. <laughs> anyway, the point was... He was uh, Paul Bearer. Anyway, uh, Sting said... Yeah, they had a fight. Because of their history, he was going to let that go. Oh, yeah, so AJ slapped him, and Sting said, well, I'm going to let that go. And AJ said, don't let it go, and slapped him again. And they had a brawl, and as the TNA world champion, and uh, the, the I guess he's I guess now he's the number one babyface, or number two babyface, AJ Styles, as they're having that brawl at ringside, they fight for four seconds, and Mike Tanae screams, there's something going on in the back. And we go to the back to see Kurt Angle be, beating up uh, Curry Man, then beating up Shark Boy, and then beating up, not Super Eric, Eric Young. Because you see, it's real now. Eric Young, happy hanging out with his parents, didn't have his mask on, but ran in to make the save and still got killed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Show sucks. It was to the back, yes, to the uh, to that segment. And then uh, after the, the whole Curry Man Shark Boy deal, we had Borash with Booker and Charmel, more talking about elephants and dogs this time. No idea what they were talking about. As, as with most Booker promos, I don't know. I don't know what he was talking about. I know it was great. I know he said that he killed elephants with his bare hands. Yeah. And then they talked about Hernandez, who we called Gonzalez. And then they said next week on Impact, Booker would reveal the contents of his briefcase. This is a perfect example of why TNA sucks. They they made this announcement, and Borash's eyes got wide, and, and later in the show the announcers were freaking out, and they said, the mystery will be solved. We'll finally find out what's in the briefcase. Not knowing that for anyone watching the show, there's no reason to care what's in the briefcase. It's just a metal box that he hits people with. It is. No, no one else on the show other than Jerry Borash has ever tried to find out what was in there. 
AJ Styles didn't try to find out. Christian Cage didn't try to find out. No one tried to find out what was in the briefcase. Booker carried it around like a month, and now he's going to open it. Whoop you shit. Well, it's the uh, Legends title, for those of you wondering. What's a Legends title, you ask? No one knows. It's just... It's called the seniors belt. It's for the old guys that can't uh, win the young uh, the young guys belt, I guess. So then it was uh, Booker and Hernandez, which was fine. It was funny that Hernandez was so he was treated him like a baby. This is the lightest comeback you've ever seen on Booker T. And anyway, it ended up with um, Charmel took the ref. Booker gave him a low blow and then hit him with the briefcase for the pin. And uh, Earl Hebner actually deserves to be in the Hall of Fame because uh, he is the, the only TNA ref who actually doesn't see interference. He makes a point to be distracted when there's a low blow or a weapon being used. Yeah. Yes, that's he's true. He's the only one. He knows what he's doing. Well, him and Shane Sewell. Then we had uh, to the back again. This time, Angle was beating up Rock and Raves. Then it was to the back again for the blonde interviewing Roxy, whose gimmick is that she swears. <laughs> gimmick is that she doesn't give a fuck about Abyss, and she doesn't give a fuck about TNA or Spike TV. She said, I quote, Kong, I don't give a shit about Kong. I don't give a shit about Spike TV. And then she said Kong could kiss her ass, and she told the big bitch to bring it. And, she said. And uh, she was talking here about how she never wins, and that's okay, it's all about winning. And she talked about how she had been like sh- had her head shaved and been cut open with a chair and didn't win very much. And I, I thought it was, so your new gimmick is you never win and you swear a lot. That's her new gimmick. Wow. Yeah. And then it was uh, to the back again, third time in a row, by the way. Chrissy ran into the beautiful people who accosted her. And For no reason. We were supposed to care about this, by the way. <laughs> Christy was apparently going to the hospital to see her men, and they stopped her and were beating her up. And then they, they bagged her. And I'm stunned that the TNA has not thought of the term double bag in her yet. Mm, indeed. But uh, missed opportunity. <laughs> There's still time. But, yes, let's review who Christy Hemme is. For the past, like, six months, she's the redhead who comes out with the men with the toy guitars, screams a bit, and does the splits, and that's it. And that's all, that there, that's all we know about her. She is a, a comedy character who is there to be hated. And then suddenly, when her men get beat up by Kurt Angle, we're supposed to take her seriously and care about her, and we're supposed to be distraught as she tries to get to the hospital. And then here come the other heels who hold her hostage for no reason, other than they bumped into the, they literally bumped into each other in the hallway, and they noticed there was a camera on Christy, and that put them into a rage that there was a camera on someone other than them. Wow, that's compelling. And they yelled at her for a while, all three of them, and they didn't care about her going to the hospital. And then they. they they, they beat her up, and they put the bag on her, and then the camera was left trailing on her as she lay at the bottom of the stairwell, while apparently dead, with a bag on her head. Dead. Dumb! Yeah. So then we had... Uh, Angle showed up at ringside. Yeah. No music, no pyro. The crowd was just booing. And Mike Tanae said the following words, There's a bad vibe in the impact zone. I just want some fucking wrestling. That's true. There is a bad vibe in this show. He beat up Penzer, who we're supposed to be concerned about. He took the worst bump I ever saw. Yeah. His bump was so bad. I understand he's just a ring announcer. He's not trained. But his bump was so bad that when Kurt took off Penzer's shoe and started hitting him with it, I was like, yes, hit him harder. Kill this fucker. Hit him with his shoe. And then it cut a promo, and Super Jarrett came out. Yes. Now, keep in mind, at this point, Kurt Angle had beat up all four guys in the opening tag match, all three guys in the Prince Justice Brotherhood, the Rock and Rave infection by himself, now the announcer, and now he's or the ring announcer, and he was fighting off security and all the referees. But out comes Super Jarrett to save the day. Let it go, Kurt, he said. Let it go. And Angle said he couldn't let it go. And it led to Angle saying, remember a while ago when I first signed with TNA and you invited me to your house and... You know, I I ate with you and your wife and children. He said, maybe Uncle Kurt should go back and pay him another visit. And so Jarrett went to beat him up, and Angle cackled that he had got in her skin, and I just thought, um, isn't this like a threat? A a, a threat on children on national television? Yeah. (laughs) You know, shouldn't you just call the cops, buddy? Between that and, 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 and the open cursing, for the second time in the show, they were cursing each other in the segment. I thought to myself, remember the at the pay-per-view when you talked about the chair shot and you said, no matter how hard you hit a guy with a chair, you're not going to convince anyone it's real. Yeah. No matter how loud you swear at someone in the middle of the ring, you're not going to convince anyone it's real. No. You know, no one's calling, Vince. This is what I want you to do. You want me to go get a phone? Go, go in the other room, All shut right. this door, and, and call him. We'll, we'll do part of this with you I will do the, the next segment from the couch. All right. Well, you don't need him anymore. 
Yeah, I did. All right, Vinny's going to go into the other room. If you guys could only hear how loud this fucker is when he's when he's doing this show. Just yells and screams like a madman. Hopefully he calls here pretty soon. Next segment is going to be the, uh, what do we have? Oh, we just talked about uh, Super Jarrett and his, his insanity. So that was that. And, oh, here's supposed to be Vinny. Vince, is that you? Oh, I can't hear you. What the hell did I do? Oh, I pushed the wrong button. There we go. What's up? Hi. Hey. What's going on? Well, we're going to do this segment here and, and uh, see how horrible it sounds. I should just start driving home. Hey, you may as well. <laughs> well I, I can already hear some horrible feedback right now. It's it's hilarious. Great. All right, well, let's... um. And you're very quiet. Should I shout more? No, I think it's a problem on my end. Probably. As, as it usually is. All right, Vinny, what, uh, let's talk about the Foley segment here. All right. Um, hold on a minute. Hey, hey, uh, to talk about the Foley segment. I'm going to fuck around with this stuff. So Mick Foley came out. He walked out, and the announcer noted this is his goodbye segment. And he talked about how, because of the type of career he had had, the wild, out-of-control wrestling he had done, the hardcore action, the falls he had taken, people were under the impression that he loves pain. He loves pain, said, yeah. That's not true. I don't love pain. The truth is, I'm a junkie. A I'm junkie, a, you say? A junkie. Yeah. And he got a big smile, and he said, I'm a roller coaster junkie. And he said the world was his theme park, and then he spent a minute or so plugging various roller coasters around the country. And, he, and they never mentioned exactly why he was uh, quitting, by the way. Mm. No? Okay. All right. He said the thing about roller coasters is sometimes you get burned out and you need to go back to the hotel and take a nice refreshing dip in the pool. Then you yes. back back up to the coaster. So, okay, that sort of makes sense. Then he said that TNA refreshed him, like a dip in a pool. So does that mean that WWE is the roller coaster in here for a dip in the pool and he's going back? Because that was the message I got. And so then he uh, talked about how there was... There are only so many times you can be a special guest enforcer, and he said that number of times was one. And so he had done everything he could possibly do in TNA. That is, that is exactly what he said, in fact. And so he is leaving. And they played his music, and he waved goodbye, and Mike Tanay, with like a, a tear in his in his eye and a, a crack in his voice, started talking about how great it was to see him again and what he had done for everyone. And then he started to walk up the ramp. And here's, like, Jay Lethal out to shake his hand and give him a hug. And Constantine is there to give him a handshake and a hug. And I think they should have had this entire segment. They should have been playing that uh, Leave the Memories Alone song they had for Rick Flair at WrestleMania. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, I mean, this is what this was supposed to be, was was uh, the big retirement ceremony. For all the great times they've had over the last three weeks. Exactly, yeah. This company is stupid. <laughs> I, I just love that. I mean, I was sitting there waiting for an explanation. And the explanation was apparently that you can only be a guest referee one time. <laughs> yes, once in your life, and his was up. He has the greatest ac acquisition. You know, it's funny. We were talking about this on the Dave show, and and I was trying to ask Dave, you know, what what what? Uh, I mean, explain this to me. And and he didn't have an explanation. And no, uh, no one does. And, and then I watched it. It was like this is actually worse watching it. Then it was reading about it in the spoilers. It was a horrible, horrible thing. I, I can't say on, on, on lots of horrible things on the show. I don't think it was that high, but it was just so dumb. <laughs> it, it was horrible since it was devoid of quality. I wasn't angered by it. I was amused at how useless it was. And then the best part was after he uh, met with Jared on the top of the ramp. They went back to Tanae, and uh, and Tanae's like. Oh, uh, man, you know, Jared, Jared's going to talk him into staying or this and that. And, and it was like, okay, so you, you first off, you, you, you had the the wacky, uh, the, the retirement after three weeks, and then you've already done the potential comeback in the same segment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they couldn't even wait till the end of the show. They had to do it in the same segment. Yeah. This was bad. They have no clue what they're doing. No, they don't. Literally, they don't know what they're doing. All right, Vinny, you're, you're, you're excused now. Come back on in here, and, and we'll see how this sounds. Thanks, boss. All right, bye. That's right, boss, everybody. I just cranked everything up as high as it goes, and we're going to see uh, we're gonna see how this sounds here. So let me get Vinny back. and uh, Hold on, everybody. All right, Vinny, listen to this. 
Well, everybody, I listened to it. It was awful. (laughs) There is some heavy, heavy clipping. Before, it sounded like you were doing the show in an aluminum shed. You know what's funny is I I did the call-in show today, and it, like, sounded great through all the calls. And then I called Lance, and for, like, the first eight minutes, it sounded perfect. And then all of a sudden, I didn't touch a goddamn thing, and it just went off a cliff. I have no earthly idea why. Maybe his voice, something in his voice. Maybe it's Canadians? Maybe it's a, it's a special tone. Oh, I didn't turn you back up. <laughs> That's the wrong slider. You didn't turn me back up, and then you turned the wrong slider. You've been talking this whole time, and no one can hear you. <laughs> this is the dirt worst show we've ever done. <laughs> right? It wasn't until right then. Now it is without question. I don't even care. I've seriously done all I can. I mean, I'm losing my mind. I've got no sleep for like three days. I've done nothing but fuck around with this thing. I'm totally losing my mind. It is 1.34 in the morning. I, I don't even want to talk about that. 10. Cornette on the phone announced that Angle was running rough shot, so he was signing him to a match with Matt Morgan later. We had uh, Roxy against Raisha, which was actually a wrestling match. It was fine. Kong tried to interfere, close on the post. Roxy hit her Cajun bomb in the ring for the pin. And then uh, Kong ended up uh, going back in there and beating her up afterwards. And uh, that was that. Roxy's and, music should have been nothing but a series of bleeps. Yeah, may as well have been. <laughs> She'd just say fuck as she takes if Shit, she gets fuck. hit. <laughs> Shit, fuck. <clears throat> You're ill. Almost vomited. Blonde interviewed Matt Morgan, who was very concerned about his friend Chris Parks. Yes. Yeah. I say again, you're not going to convince me this is real. No. By using real names, that won't do it. Now, I. that being said, this was the best TNA segment in some time, because uh, my eyes cannot believe what happened. Open that door a little more. Matt Morgan. Getting a weird echo. All the way. Better? Yeah, all the way. Actually, that does help, doesn't it? Yeah, it's so there's acoustics in this room. Okay, it's on. the room. Okay. Anyway, Matt Morgan uh, was talking about an angle that happened on pay-per-view. Didn't happen earlier on the show. Didn't happen in this segment. It happened several days before. And then something transcendent happened. They showed a replay. And they did. I was amazed. <laughs> I was taken aback. I couldn't believe they did something right. Anyway, uh, Morgan said that he talked a bit into the match. He didn't blame Team 3D or anyone else. He blamed himself. And he said he'd have to live with this forever. Then we have Christy freaking out again backstage, saying if she didn't have to be at the hospital right now, she would kill the beautiful people. Notice she was not in the hospital. <laughs> no. So and about you. 20 minutes ago, she claimed she was leaving for the hospital. She was distraught and leaving. She, she wanted to leave, and she was angry at the beautiful people because they wouldn't let her leave. Then they beat her up, and then she stayed long enough to cut her promo before going. Mm-hmm. Thumb. Then we had uh, Consequences Creed cutting a very nutty promo about his upcoming match with Nash. This promo ruled. It was wacky. He was so excited about this opportunity he had. He was going to make the most of it, and he was he hyped it up great, and I was like, yeah, go Consequences. Then they had the match. Yeah, I should mention, by the way, that next week in Vegas, it's uh, Taylor Wilde against Awesome Kong live for the title. I predict title change. So there you go. Putting it on the record right now. Nash against Creed, perfect example of a man working around another man. Nash uh, stood there unmoving as Creed ran around him, and then Nash uh, beat him up and powerbombed him for the pin. Creed came off like the jobber of a lifetime here. And then Nash cut what I thought was actually a hell of a funny uh, heel promo. He pulled out every heel line in the book. He said the people sucked. He said he was rich and they were poor. He said all the women wanted to fuck him. And, uh yeah. That was pretty much it. He, he, there were other great uh, giants in history, like Goliath and the guy on the top of the Jack and the Beanstalk. And the difference between him and those giants was that he was a genius. So yes, in, in the segment, this segment, he described himself as uh, tall, rich, smart, hot. Did I miss anything? Good looking. Good looking. Well, same thing. Yeah. And uh, and uh, all the young guys are arrogant and stupid. Yeah. And he's getting revenge for what Joe said about Scott Hall ten months ago. Now. <laughs> why did not only why did he wait 10 months but Joe's been champion for a long time if Nash wanted to screw Joe out of the championship he's had many many opportunities to do so why didn't he I don't know I don't know I have no answer and then we had uh, Team 3D doing an interview and uh, what happened during the interview the, the blonde said it wasn't so much a wrestling match you had at the pay-per-view it was an assault on Chris Parks 
All right, so the main event was Morgan and Angle, and kind of a boring match until Morgan started making his comeback. And then he's making his big comeback, and he went for the elevator, and Angle just slipped behind and pinned him clean with the Angle slam. And I can hear Crumley right now. I can just hear his blood pressure rising because he knows I'm going to say something negative about this clean finish, and I'm going to. So here we go. TNA has fucked themselves over because they they have done so many fuck finishes with their main eventers that the only people that ever get pinned clean are jobbers. And as you noted, of all the matches to have a clean finish, when this was over and Matt Morgan lost clean to an Olympic slam, he looked like the biggest fucking loser. He was a step above consequences creed. He was a slightly taller Eric Young. This was retarded. And there, it's their own fault. There are so many. If, if 80% of the finishes were clean, then this might have meant something. But what it meant when 80% of the, uh, or 95% of the main event cl- uh, finishes have run ins and, and rep bumps and bullshit like that, yeah, the idea was to get Angle over strong, and they did. But they did it at the expense of Matt Morgan. Of Matt Morgan. Matt Morgan. <laughs> Matt Morgan, who they, they talked about how WWE had wasted his potential and, mm-hmm. and all of his other bullshit. This was uh, this may have this this was up there with that stuttering gimmick. Uh, just a clean this pin, clean a nothing here, match. As, as as you noted, it was their first clean pin in months in the main event. I think I, one of the few on well, there's some on the show, but as you noted, main eventers don't ever lose here unless they suck. And so the message here with the fans was, look, this guy got pinned with a wrestling move. He sucks. Yeah. The other sucky thing about this was that. Uh, Jerry Borash did ring intros, which in and of itself is not horrible. Dave Pinter had been taken out by Anger earlier, Angle earlier, and so they had a, an, un- an unidentified female doing most of the intros in the show. And for this match, it was Jeremy Borash. Now, in and of itself, I wouldn't have a problem with this, except earlier they did a really dumb segment with uh, Jeff Jarrett and Mick Foley, wherein Jerry Borash was there. He got no answers. He declared, I'm going to get some answers. He followed Mick down the hallway, and the next time we saw him, Red light's back. Yes, this is going to be bad. The, the next time we saw Jeremy Borash, he was in the ring doing intros, and then he ran back out to the parking lot, apparently, to get more answers. Yeah. Which is the segment here, actually. And, uh, and the segment was... Uh, the segment was Jeff Jared Jarrett and Foley. Mick Foley getting into a car, apparently driving to Vegas, and all I could think was, that would be an awesome road trip. It's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with Jared and Foley. That would be great. They, they should have done this last week, and then this week was just all their trip. Yes. That would have been an awesome, awesome, awesome bit. And then uh, Mick said he'd have an announcement that would shake the foundation of the wrestling world. And it's not an accus- it's not an acquisition. And he said it's not something else either, but I forget what the other something else was. But, yeah, big announcement next week. That was the end of the show. A S- bad show. A very stupid episode of Impact. It wasn't the worst Impact of all time, but just generally bad. So, so amazingly stupid. To the back! As noted, Impact sucked. Boy, did it suck. How did it suck? How 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 profoundly did it suck? What was the Shakespeare line? How many ways did it suck? How did it suck? Let me count the ways. I'm sure that's in there somewhere. One of his sonnets, I think. It, well, yeah. Uh, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. How do I hate thee? Impact. Let me count the ways. There are many. The production sucked. Dear God, yes. There was two minutes of wrestling in the first 52 minutes of the show. There was one good match. The main event was a disaster. The gauntlet match was an even bigger disaster. The big announcement was stupid. There was a lot of people talking about stuff that I don't even understand what the hell they were saying. Bad show. Not the worst impact ever, but it was actually made significantly worse by the fact that it was such a big show and it was this bad. Yeah. A higher standard, a need for a bigger show, and boy, did they they drop the ball. Now, if you were going live, you're in Las Vegas, it's live... It's the uh, first Impact in HD, new building, you're in Vegas. Why would you open the show with Christy Hemi and Velvet Sky? Were we not just talking about openers a couple days ago? We were, about how you want to have either the top stars or some good action. This was neither. Velvet Sky and Christy Hemi. That seriously opened up the show. Right. The, uh, the the first live impact, the first HD impact, the big show from Las Vegas for the biggest announcement ever opened with Christy Hammy wrestling Velvet Sky. It was horrible. Christy oh. fucked up a monkey flip. Uh, what else do we have? Um, the fire crotch leg drop was a finisher, which looks like it sucks. And Kip took a funny bump off the apron. 
And uh, that was our match. Cute Kip was the only redeeming factor about this. Think for... about actually, well, yeah, well, no, the entrance. Well, okay, and, and their asses, yes. But Cute Kip came out they, they, in the graphic. <laughs> what a pig! In in the graphic, it reads. It's true, but what a pig! It, it reads quote cute unquote Kip as if. The people in the production truck don't really think he's cute, but they're just going with what he tells them to put up there. So it says, cute Kip, and he comes out there, and they're having this terrible match, and uh, it, they're in the joint, which UFC did a million shows in, and always looked crappy. Yeah, it actually looked kind of good here, and then they got the heat from no, the show. No, it didn't. Let me cut you off right, right there. Go ahead. Because I want to talk about the joint. Talk about the joint. Now, UFC is running the joint, and it seats like a 1,000. I think they sold like a 1,000 tickets, and... If if you tuned into this show, did it ever look like there was more than 150 to 200 people in the building? No. No. C- c- counting all the wrestlers in the locker room, it did not reach 200 people. Now, let me ask you this question. How can you be so bad at production that you fit 1,000 people in the building and it looks like 250? Well, I don't know. They're doing something wrong. I, I defy anybody listening to this to tell me that they tuned in and thought it looked like 1,000 people there. They managed some usually like usually most entertainment companies can make a a half full building look full. Well, think about what they do in the impact zone where 90% of the crowd is on one side of the ring so the crowd looks double. Actually, actually the impact zone seats I believe less people than the Hard Rock. You can fit about 100 more people in the joint. It was a joint, I'm sorry. Wherever they were in Vegas. You can fit about 100 more people in there than in the impact zone. Did it look even remotely close to how many people are in the impact zone? No, as noted, they referred to be 150 to 200 people there. A phenomenal production snafu. How these people are still employed. Well, we'll get. There's more. There is more and worse to come. But I, the reason I say it looked good, Brian, is because the people who were there were clearly having a great time. They were jumping up and down. They were chanting things. They were loud. They were active. And all I could think was, UFC did like eight shows here, and we had to beg them to leave, and they finally did. And, and the shows there always were, were flat shows in front of lame crowds. And this is in front of what appeared to be a smaller crowd, but a very happy one. So I, I liked that. So it was it was cool to be in a different building. Yes, it was very cool to be in a different building. They, 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 they had this horrible women's match here in Las Vegas. And all I could think was, oh, my God, Glow is still around. Glow has made a comeback starring Christy Hemme and Velvet Sky. And they had this horrible match. And Velvet did a spot where she had Christy in the corner. And she climbed up in the corner like you would do with like the, the 10 punch in the corner. And then she pulled Christie's head three inches forward and rammed it three inches back into the into the padded turnbuckle. And I suppose there was a cunnilingus reference going on here, but it would just looked dumb. And then Christie made a big comeback, and it was sloppy and bad and amateurish. And she went up top, and Kip James, 260 pounds, six foot five, wall of muscle, Kip James leapt up in the apron to interfere. Christie threw her forearm at him. And he took this awesome, wacky bump from this tiny girl and the damage he had wrought to his body. Cute Kip is awesome. I like him more now than I have at any point in his career. Wow. And, and, then, and then Christy hit the leg drop and won, and that was the opener of the live HD era of Impact. They've got a new opening, by the way, which is pretty cool. It was pretty cool. There was lots of... I still can't get over the 250 in the building. It's uh, seriously... It <laughs> this looked like they filmed at Tulela Championship Wrestling. Like, if they moved everybody in Toledo to one side of the building and just put the hard camera there, that's what this looked like. Including perhaps the same people, because there was one fan in particular who knew he was going to be on live national television, knew he had a seat front row center, perhaps knew he was even going to be on on the hard camera side, so he'd be on TV 40 to 50% of this broadcast, and he showed up fat, sleeveless T-shirt, skinny arms, mullet and a goatee. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, and and, and the, uh, the, the tribal tattoo around his non-bicep. Yeah. Phenomenal man. Now, then we head to the back with Borash interviewing Angle. And long story short, there was Angle, Booker T, and Nash in the room. And they talked about how they wanted respect. You know the whole nine years. Respect. By now. And then they announced that there were three of them. This is when Borash said, you know, you guys are outnumbered here. There's a whole locker room and there's just three of you. And, and Angle's like, oh, no, there's one more. Like, maybe that one more four against 30 would even Overcome me 30 guys, yes. And you know, it's kind of funny because when you mentioned there was one more guy, I thought, hmm, I wonder who this is. Like, my interest peaked for a moment. I thought, hey, RVD is here. Well, no, I, I didn't think that. But my interest was peaked for a moment, and I thought, man, maybe, you know, th- this this would be the time to hold off this announcement till later on in the show. But, of course, no. Then they, they just had to make the announcement immediately. Fourth man was Sting. 
So he came in with sunglasses, cut a promo, and, and a immediately left. And then Angle announced that this new group was the Main Event Mafia, born tonight. Yeehaw. The new horsemen. Theoretically. I guess. Of Sting, Kurt, Booker, and Kevin Nash. Yeah. I, I can't. No, it was stupid, but it entertained me. Booker T was being wacky and having a, a mysterious African accent in which he claimed that lions run in packs. Not, you know, prides. And uh, Sting came in and ordered the five of them, counting Charmel, had 75. <laughs> what a dork moment that was. I have a dork. I can't help it. I'm an editor. I, I... <laughs> That's the one thing in this whole segment that perf- that, um, that annoyed you in such a manner. It didn't annoy me. It amused me. All right. So Sting came in. He noted that the five of them, counting Charmel, had 75 combined years of wrestling experience. That's 15 years per person. So, yes, he, he confirmed they are, in fact, old. Then uh, <laughs> Kurt Angle said with a straight face that the business of pro wrestling was founded on honor Dignity and respect. What a bullshitter. <laughs> that was a pile of bullshit. <laughs> There's a modicum of respect some people have for each other. No honor, no dignity, and not since day one. And the other highlight of this, and the real highlight, whenever anyone said the word respect, Booker would always shout it at exactly the same level they did. So when Nash started talking about it, Nash talked about money, power, respect. Booker shouted, respect! And later Sting came in and said, we just asked for a little respect. And Booker said, respect. Booker's great. Yeah. Yeah. He's horrible. No, he's great. And he's funny. He's, 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 I, I love Booker. He's hilarious. But he entertains me. This is a clown troop. Yeah. It's, it's not tough. supposed to be. <laughs> well, it is. It's not supposed to be a clown troop. Dude, you still have aspirations for the show that I, I'm years and years and years past. As long as it entertains me, that's all I ask. Well, it just didn't entertain me. It did? No, the whole show in general made me mad, even <laughs> attempting to be entertained. Then we had, um, oh, then we had something even dumber. Um, Booker came out and said that, uh, oh, fully arrived first in a like a VW Bug or some little ghetto car. They were trying to talk about how ghetto it was. It was this white and seafoam green Volkswagen Bug, and I thought, that looks cool. Anyway, he said that he was going to wait until the Hard Rock was full to make his announcement. Not everyone showed up when the show started, everybody. I guess not. And she wanted to know how big the announcement was, and he said, it's big, Lauren, real big. And this made her sad, because apparently she wanted the answer in inches or yards Pounds. or some, some sort of <laughs> some metric. Yeah, she wanted a number. Just big wasn't enough for her. So then we had Booker come out and announce that he was now the new TNA Legends champion. He had a new belt. He pulled out this belt. It's a shiny gold wrestling belt with red leather. The crowd went crazy. Yeah. And Don West screamed, unbelievable. And then a few seconds passed, and he asked, in this exact tone, what's it for? (laughs) Booker said, uh, he didn't even really explain. He just said it was for the legends. And then we had the dumbest thing I've ever seen, at least for this (laughs) five-minute period. For this segment, yes. So Booker's talking about his big belt, and out comes Christian. And... Booker offers him a shot in the main event mafia, and he says he's not he's not taking it up, not interested. And Christian proceeds to bury the belt. He said it was a fake belt that Booker had never beaten anyone for. True. Then a few minutes later, he challenges Booker to a match at the pay per view for the belt. Then he says, "I actually don't want. I don't really want to win the belt. I just want to piss you off by winning the belt." So, as he goes to leave, Booker accepts the challenge, but says, hold on a second. I'm adding a stipulation to this pay-per-view match. If you win, you get the belt. If I win, you have to join the main event mafia, no questions asked. Now, (laughs) where would you like to begin? Why the fuck would Christian ever say yes? What does he possibly stand to win in this match? He doesn't want the belt. Right. He doesn't want to be in the main event mafia. No. It is a lose-lose situation for him. I have a much better question, I think. If you're Booker T, and Christian Case has just told you, I don't want to be in the main event mafia, why would you want to force him to join? Wouldn't that just put someone in your crew who hates you and wants to screw all of you up? Sure. But he hates the man. He's trying to make him suffer. How would that make Christian suffer? These questions are all stupid. (laughs) He's, I'm just trying to figure out this belt situation. And then there is the belt. Now, I, I just don't understand why you would bury the belt 
Say it's a nothing belt, and say the man did nothing to deserve it, and you don't want it. But then say you want a match for the belt to piss Booker off. That's his goal. He will piss Booker off, and then he will take the belt and light it on fire. So if he accepts this match, he's a goddamn fool. If he accepts this match, well, no. If he wins, he gets to piss Booker off. If he loses, he gets to sabotage Booker's future matches by screwing up his interference and whatnot. I call bullshit. See, I see. I think it's lose lose for Booker. I think it's lose lose for me. It's only lose lose for the fans and the show and TNA. This was bad. Then Morgan and Abyss did a promo backstage, and Morgan said he wasn't going to allow Abyss to wrestle tonight since he was too hurt. And Abyss in his wrestling gear insisted he could wrestle. Claimed he had third degree burns over a third of his body. He said they were pus filled, and a line I did not need to hear. Now listen, I I have. Uh, I've been trying to follow Impact fairly closely over the last couple of weeks because I'm often confused. And I could have sworn that on last week's Impact, they said that on this show, there was going to be a rematch of Monster's Ball. I could have sworn they said that. Do you remember this? They, they, they said it would be... I remember because they gave it a st- stupidly long name. There was like an eight-word name for this match. And I understood there would be a gauntlet involved in text voting. So I knew it would not be another Monsters Ball match. I could have sworn they said another Monsters Ball. Maybe it was two weeks ago. Anyway, the point was, it's not a Monsters Ball. Yes. It was a a very dumb match. It was a text tag team hardcore gauntlet pile of shit. It was. Oh, we're not adding it. <laughs> like eight segments in the future. Oh, God. Jarrett did an interview about the big announcement. Said he was going to spoil it for Mick. And Morash wanted to know if... Jarrett was going to give Angle a rematch, and he said no, and that was that. One, one more note on the Abyss Morgan thing. Abyss said, I want to wrestle. Morgan said, no, you're too hurt. Are there no doctors in TNA? No. There's no physician backstage to check you out and say, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? Of course not. Just what a checking. stupid question. Then we had the Sheik against Jay Lethal for the X title, and Lethal wiped him out early with a tope. And early? Yeah. The match only went 90 seconds. Well, that was early. It was all early. And uh, it went about two minutes. Oh, I, sorry. <laughs> well, this is important because I'm timing how much wrestling we have on the show. This was the second match, by the way. I 39 see. minutes into the show, this started. So, anyway, uh, he went for flying elbow and missed. Sheik hit a DDT for the pin. Like I said, about two minutes. For the pin. For the pin. Sheik hit one move the entire match. Well, that's his WMD, they claim. It was his finisher. That, so there's at least that. But, yes, uh, Lethal ran wild for a minute 45. She hit his finisher and won the end. Yep. Yay, Impact. Blonde interviewed AJ and Joe. AJ was crying that he didn't know how it came to this. He said it was now the veterans versus the young guys, and the company was falling apart. Falling apart at the seams, he said. Not two weeks after AJ and, and Foley and Jared all talking about the, the peaks the company has risen to, two weeks later the company is falling apart at the seams. I'm confused. I also like that in, in, in TNA's debut here, their, their debut in live and HD, AJ Styles chose to show up in jeans and a plain white T-shirt. Of course. Joe at least had jeans and a designer T-shirt, so I'll give him that much credit. AJ looked like he was about to go do more landscaping. And then Joe ranted and raved and screamed into the camera, called Nash a scumbag, said he was going to end his career like Nash ended his title reign, and that was that. AJ at one point put his hand on Joe's shoulder, and Joe threw him out of the way and said, get off of me. So let it be known that in their very first appearance together on camera as partners, they're already fighting. Sure. It gets better in the main event, by the way. So then we had uh, the suicide promo. Oh, forget that. (laughs) Rhino cut a promo on Bashir backstage, said he was sick of all his political crap, and he was going to deport him. Deport him. <laughs> Back to Michigan, I guess. And, uh, Bashir then booted him in the nuts and beat him up. And meanwhile, the blonde shrieked in the background. This and then is awful. Screamed, can I get some help? Not bothering to ask the cameraman. And uh, wretched. They had a horrible brawl. Wretched. 52 minutes into the show, by the way. Still only four minutes of wrestling. And then, what a 15 minutes of wrestling we got. The gauntlet. It was a hardcore tag I team. I think you gauntlet. just read your notes here verbatim. Uh, I got to save something for the newsletter. <laughs> they had voting that was supposedly going to choose the entry of. I thought the teams. Apparently, it was. It was. I don't know what it was. Even though it was a tag team gauntlet, they were still fighting as individuals. It was a Royal Rumble. Okay. God damn it. <laughs> there were four teams, and people were going to enter this Royal Rumble. 
one at a time in one-minute intervals, and fans got to text votes to determine the order of entry of the teams. So that means if the Dudleys got the least votes, then one of the Dudleys started. One member of the second lowest voted team went second. Then the next Dudley came in. Then the next member of the next team. Now, as convoluted as that sounds, I at least figured it out. But we ended up having uh, Bubba start with Rude, and then James Storm came in, which would mean logically the next person in was Devon, which even I knew, but Don West was surprised. So he had no idea what was going on. Okay, here is where I think you have erred. No. No? I don't think so. I don't think there was voting for teams. There was. I think it was voting for individuals. It was voting for teams. How do you know? Because it was, they had the teams on the screen. This was the way it was set up in advance. The, there was pictures of the teams, but if you looked at the bottom, it was, all it said was send text to, and there was a number, and then there was the eight individual names. Now, we should not have to fight about this. And don't check your notes as reference. I'm not checking my notes. I'm going to check somebody else's notes. Whose notes are you checking? Larry Kasanka. That's a better source. And the Observer. Eh? <laughs> okay. That's right. So, Bunker. regardless, now... I also thought, because it was a tag team gauntlet, you see, I figured the teams are coming out one at a time, so we start with two teams, then that another, and then, the, and then the fourth. So when they announced 60 second intervals, I thought that meant all the teams would be in the ring within two minutes, and I thought, wow, that's dumb. So when they started coming out one at a time, I thought, well, at least that makes a little sense. And I think that's the last thing in the segment that made any sense at all whatsoever. So if the order of entry was Bubba, uh, Storm, Rude, Devon, Hernandez, Homicide, maybe those are backwards. No, that's right. And then, um, let's see. Then, then Morgan and then Abyss was Morgan last. Morgan and Abyss. Those are all the teams in order. So I can't fathom. Uh, this is, this is way too coincidental. It's either, it's either full of shit, the voting, or it was voting for teams. Point is, this was what happened. And Don West was still confused. I knew Devon was coming out and Don West didn't. That's the point of this fucking thing. I see. You've got me off my game here. Well, the match began. It was it started, as noted, several times with Bubba Ray Dudley versus Robert Rude. And Bubba Ray Dudley, for the 60 seconds they were in, the, in there alone, he played the baby face. He was running wild. He was dancing. The crowd was going crazy. And Don West said, well, you know how he feels about beer money anyway. And I thought, I do? Then later he said, Bubba Ray thinks that beer money has stolen their thunder. And I thought, he does? When? What? What are you talking about? And I was I, that perplexed me as well. Then uh, James Storm came out. They uh, ran wild on Bubba Ray for a while. They hit the beer money suplex. Now, we've been marking out for this move for like four months now. It's very simple. They do a double team suplex. One guy schemes beer. The other guy schemes money. This move still confuses the TNA director. To the point where they hit the suplex, and they chose to focus on Bubba Ray Dudley, who was just lying there grimacing. And we missed the beer and then the money. Way to go, guy. And it gets worse. Any idea what these rules are? I'm, I'm, I'm reading two different reports, and nobody has any idea how this fucking thing works. <laughs> do, do you need to match up with yours? Jesus Christ. Let me get on with this whole stupid thing. Anyway, the point was, <sighs> I don't even know what happened at the end. <laughs> well, okay. Hold on a second. You want to get more? All right. Morgan... First off, Don West was promising it was going to get more chaotic, which pissed me off. <laughs> I didn't want it more simple. <laughs> that was his selling point. There was going to be more chaos. Oh, we forgot something. As the match began, the words table, chair, and ladder appeared on the screen, and it said, send your text vote now. And Don West told us that the winner of that text vote would then be a legal weapon in this match we were watching right now. So you had six minutes to vote. Hurry, hurry, vote, vote, vote. So, anyway. The match goes on. Hold on. Calm down. It's my turn here. All right. I've got much to say. So, finally, Matt Morgan came in and tossed a bunch of dudes. And this is where I I just... This is where it completely fell to shit. So, Matt Morgan starts throwing out dudes. And I could have sworn that earlier they made it clear that Abyss wasn't going to be allowed to wrestle. So, as Matt Morgan's in there, they're doing a countdown anyway. Now... He's the last guy except for Abyss. Right. So the countdown should have alerted him to something. 
So when it counts down in the last man, who uh, they pretended like they didn't know who it could possibly be. Yes. And it's the last man of eight known men, right. or however many it was. It was eight. Abyss comes out, and everybody's shocked, and Matt Morgan is mad. Now, as Matt Morgan is not paying attention or something like that, he gets dumped outside. Now, if you have this on tape, go watch the single worst elimination in the history of Battle Royals in Matt Morgan. I have worked God knows how many Battle Royals. I've never seen an elimination this bad. He was he was pushed slowly over the top by two men. He sat down on the apron. He laid down to a reclining position. And then, of his own power, he rolled off the apron to the floor. So I once met, watched a man... Uh, exited Battle Royal and promptly break his leg. That was better than this. So as soon as he got thrown out, they announced that uh, tables had won. So Team 3D starts getting tables. And I had no earthly idea who their opponents were. The only two in the ring were Team 3D. I, at this point, assumed the tag match had started, and it was Team 3D versus the table. I did, too. I, I thought that they were going to be facing the table in this match. So uh, they start lighting the table on fire, and Abyss gets in the ring. And I'm thinking, what the fuck's this guy doing in the ring? So apparently he hadn't gotten in the ring originally. So as soon as he got in the ring, they threw him out of the ring. And then then the tag match was on. And somehow beer money ended up in this tag match. How? I don't know. <laughs> we have no idea. It's actually even more chaotic than you're, than you're giving them credit for because Abyss came out. Morgan was confused. Morgan got, quote, dumped, unquote. Then suddenly everyone in the match was fighting on the floor. It was a Royal Rumble in which everyone had entered and no men were in the ring. And then uh, we saw uh, Team 3D sitting at the table, as noted. They, I thought it was Team 3D versus the table. Then Abyss came in. I said, okay, it's Abyss and Morgan versus Team 3D in the tag match with the tables legal. Got it. Then they dumped Abyss. <laughs> now keep in mind, earlier, if I think Devon was the first guy out. And now here he was just sitting at the table. The no, this makes sense. Yet. This is what everybody does. Someone else brought this up, too. This doesn't make sense. They fucked up. As soon as it was announced that Tables won, the Dudleys thought that the tag match was starting. Now, the Battle Royal was going to come down to two men. And the final two men reformed their teams for a tag match. Okay. So, Bubba and Devon, when they announced Tables, thought that the, the match was over. So Devon just came back in for the tag match. And then Abyss got in, and they had to throw him out. That's why it screwed up. What a stupid fucking company. Yes! Yes. So, they set up the table. They put doused it with lighter fluid. The crowds were happy. Abyss, the victim of the previous fire attack, the guy who talked about the pus-filled burns, pus-filled burns, jumped in the ring, laid out Team 3D, and the fans went, Boo! Then Abyss teased lighting the table on fire, and they went, yay! And then they laid him out and dumped him, and the fans chanted, we want fire! Then they did this match. Now, the worst is yet to come, everybody. The worst is yet to come. So they got this table set up. It's doused with lighter fluid, but there is no lighter. It never got, went put into flames. So uh, Rude goes for a suplex. Devon quite lazily dumps behind. They hit him with a 3D through the table. Now, Rude makes a let cover. me jump in very quickly. Did I not say last week that the debut of TNA and HD was going to be a gigantic disaster? Did I not say that? I believe you did. As you mentioned, he was 3D through a table, and somebody made the cover, and the next thing I know, the match is just still going on. Here is what happened. I had to rewind it. <laughs> yes, you did. Why? <laughs> because, because they fucked up. They fucked up. Because... They hit the 3D. The director... Actually, I want to explain this one. They hit the 3D. Diva makes the cover. Bubba Ray grabs the ropes and starts to count his fist in the air. One, two, three. The referee counts one. The referee counts two. The director, at that moment, cuts to Brother Ray Dudley hanging on the ropes and counting three. Then he cuts to a wide shot and the match is still going on. That's why you were confused. That's why I was confused. That's why everyone watching this was confused. That's why no one running this company or watching this company had any idea what was going on. On further review, we saw that somebody pulled the referee out of the ring at the three count. But this is all confused because this director, who shoots pro wrestling for a living, doesn't know that at the count of three, you should show the guy making the pin fall, the guy being pinned, and the referee counting the pin. No, he chose to show the fat guy pumping his fist in the air. Dipshit! This man should be killed. How do you not show the interference at the pinfall? How do you not show that? 
Answer this. I don't have. I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't I, even know what happened after that. I don't care. This was the worst. <laughs> this was the worst segment in TNA history. I've determined. <laughs> in hindsight, actually, I did. Watching it, I had a ball. I was laughing my ass off at the, the rampant stupidity. I've never seen so much stupid bullshit. This only went 15 minutes, everyone. I think we spent more time talking about it than it actually took to happen. We've already talked on this show for 40 minutes. Yeah. I can't even believe that. <laughs> I can. And so, yes, came out the worst again, segment ever. Quiet down. I'm, I'm sick of this show. I'm going to just start fast-forwarding. Angle came out again, said tonight was a historical night, the birth of the main event mafia. They're going to change the face of pro wrestling forever. How many fucking times have I heard that? I don't know. Can you just hire Tony Schiavone already? Then he said uh, he didn't care about Foley's announcement. He only cared about Jeff. said he'd beat up his kids or go to his kid's house. I don't care. He, he said he didn't give any shit about Jeff, and he had to censor him because he was cursing here on live TV because he's hard poor. Derek Jarrett came out and said that they had the best roster ever. He didn't need to be in the ring. Angle should think about passing the torch as well. Kurt said he didn't care about Jarrett. And then Jarrett said something about look behind you and Abyss beat up Angle. Actually, Abyss went for the slam and Angle slipped away, which looked like a botched spot, but it was done on purpose. And, yeah, who cares? At this point, I realized there were 45 minutes left to go on the show. Who cares? Wow, Kurt Angle and Abyss at the pay-per-view. Yeah, what a few that's going to be. Talk about no buys. <laughs> That phrase is overused, but that is no buys. No Who one's... the fuck is buying a pay-per-view for Kurt Angle and Abyss? I don't know. Nobody. Crumbly. That is it. Oh, God. Then we had uh, Kong and Raisha Saeed. Or, uh, they did a promo, actually, saying it was going to be Taylor's last match. Not only as champion, but in life, she was going to be killed. And then Taylor said, you'd have to end my career to beat me, which was, in fact, incorrect. So they had a match. Well, you don't know that yet. It went about, I'd say, three, four minutes. It was maybe. a very fun three and a half to four minutes. Best TNA TV match in a while. Uh, Taylor looked awesome. Took some great bumps. Made an awesome comeback. Place was going crazy, and uh, finally Raisha cut her off. And as Taylor went after her, Kong grabbed her and hit a huge power bomb for the pin. So the usual Kong couldn't win the title clean. No. They had to have some sort of wacky, convoluted bullshit as they always do, and it hurt the match. But overall, it was uh, it was good. And they they showed Kong for ten seconds before it was to the back. Indeed, yes. So this is a, this is a thumbs up segment, and, and the best match in the show by leaps and bounds. And then we had Sting and Nash against AJ and Joe. They went to the commercial as the heat started. And then they came back right as the heat ended and they got the hot tag. Now, there's a point to the heat, you know. <laughs> and what would that be? Well, he's supposed to make people excited for the comeback. He's supposed to build sympathy, you see, for the babyface. Well, they didn't. It no. was just the babyface ran wild. They did a commercial. And then the babyface ran wild some more. And then the heels won after Nash hit Joe with the belt. A useless main event. There was less than four minutes of TV time for this match. No. And let me get this straight. So you, you created the main event mafia. And you couldn't even hold off the first main event Mafia versus Young Guys match for the first pay-per-view? No. You had to do it immediately on that impact an yeah. hour later? Yes. God, this place is retarded. Yes. So, a useless main event. So, yes, yeah, so they, 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 the, they did the match. Joe got pinned, everyone. Joe got pinned after he belt shot. Then at, immediately after he gets pinned, AJ starts running wild on both of the heels. AJ Styles, all five foot two of them, is beating up uh, uh, Sting and Kevin Nash. Kurt Angle and Booker T run out. They lay out the Young Guys. They all stand there, they raise each other's hands, and Angle's music plays. Yeah. Yeah. No no friends. No, no friends for Ojo and AJ. I almost fell asleep right there. Then Foley came out for his world-changing, epic, amazing, gigantic announcement. He's a shareholder in TNA. Yeah. Wow. That's changed the face of wrestling. He's he's a fake shareholder in a company that's not public. Right. All right. Yippee. Yes. So and then yeah. uh, he told... Angle came out again. Uh, Angle came out for the 18th time on the show. And and Foley says, I don't know, what the fuck happened here? Angle headbutted him, and then Foley said, I'm a shareholder. You headbutted your boss. I'm not going to fire you. And then he starts talking about how, you know, Kurt, you can either be part of history or, for, or, or you can be history. And then I guess Kurt had a... What, a decision what to make? He, he, he said, Kurt, basically he said, you can wrestle here or you can quit. The decision is up to you. And he said that, and Kurt left the ring, and they played Foley's music, and they shot confetti into the air like something amazing had just happened. When was Angle going to quit? He said, he said remember, he, they did a whole bit. The, the whole angle was he was mad at Jarrett because Jarrett was hurting 
because uh, he but wanted then, to go to WWE. Ne- never was he going to quit. <laughs> what? He never even said that in the interview that he wanted to quit. He never said in the interview that he wanted to leave. All he not, said. Not the UK son, but the, no, he said he said when my contract is up, I'm going to <laughs> I'm consider gonna, his options. I'm going to consider my options. His contract. They never said his contract was up this month. Well, what Foley said then is that you can consider your options now, and I will release you if you so desire. Oh, that's the big that's the big announcement. Oh I guess. wow, yeah, Kurt Angle's leaving everybody. Sure, this was stupid. <laughs> this show sucked. <laughs> Everything about this, except the Taylor Wild Kong match, was really, really dumb. Don't watch Impact, anyone. Stop watching immediately. Just stop. I couldn't even watch an HD to really uh, take it all in at, at its greatest. Oh God, the emails I got about this show, everybody hated it. Thanks. This show sucked. Where's Crumbly when I need him to try and defend this? To the back. Impact, as noted, was a much better show than usual. We still do not get the show in HD, and so I, I, uh, I noticed that when the show started and there was all the noise and explosions, we could not hear the announcers. No, that that the the bad production values continue. I was hoping that this would be permanent. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But no, we could hear music and 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 basically whenever the the music was off, it was fine. But when the whenever any music started, we could just hear the the we could hear mumblings from the announcers very softly. So then AJ and Joe came out, cut a promo. They got a new set, by the way, which looks really cool. There's a positive and a negative. I hate to be negative about this new set because it does look really great, but the one negative is it looks just like Raw. It looks exactly like the Raw set. Big giant screen up at the top. Guys walk out from the side, come out the middle, go down the ramp. Yeah. Yep. It's, they need to be different from WWE. And granted, this is a huge upgrade. Being different from WWE in a ghetto manner like the old Impact set, that's bad. So at least they're they're the same as WWE with a good set now. Anyway, AJ and uh, Joe came out, and uh, anyway, they talked about the main event mafia and said TNA was growing and talked about uh, how last week they got beaten up and nobody came to help them and wanted to know who had the balls to stand with them. So we got Petey Williams, Consequences Creed, Jay Lethal, Eric Young, and ODB. So the NWO, black and white. <laughs> It went from two to like fourteen in one one minute. So just a bunch of geeks. The machine guns came out and acted heelish and got in Joe's face and eventually he slapped him. So then the main event mafia came out in suits and um, there were nine baby faces in the ring and four heels on the ramp for those of you keeping track. And um, anyway, at this point the machine guns were all, all of a sudden friendly and ready to fight the bad guys. So that made no sense. But anyway, they, they all cut a promo, and Joe said the reason that Hall didn't show up at the pay-per-view many months ago was because he felt Joe wasn't worth the rub, and said they were going to get a war. Booker was still in his stupid accent, which was funny when the show was supposed to be comedy, but now they're supposed to be serious. This was so dumb. And then we had the uh, tease that there were going to be five. Uh, one more man was to come. And there was some weirdness, but overall it was a uh, pretty good segment to at least make it clear who is on whose side and what the current teams are. Uh, mostly, except, I, 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 well, I guess by the end of this we knew whose side the machine guns were on, but the machine guns apparently turned in this angle. They, they turned when the main event Mafia came out, which is weird. That, and, of course, it's weird that Joe and AJ go from having no friends to having a cast of thousands at their side. It's weird that the cast of thousands are allegedly the good guys facing off against the monolithic unstoppable force that is the bad guys it's uh, uh, I don't know uh, there's oh uh, um the, the fact that everyone just came out at random just a, just a, a, a just a random crew guys who aren't doing anything just came out and all shook hands and, and they're all the heroes now what the hell does ODB for example have to gain by this what does she have against the main event mafia is she going know. to wrestle Charmel maybe I don't know I don't know there's weirdness I also like how strange music started to play and I thought What's this? Whose song is this? And Don West said, well, there's the main event, Mafia's music. Even though I watched all the shows, this song had not been played before. He's psychic. Then we had Borash interviewing Jarrett, who uh, said, wanted to know what he was going to do about this, and Foley showed up and asked Jarrett if he cared if he improvised tonight, and Foley said he had to get some stuff off his chest about Sting. The uh, blonde interviewed the beautiful people who buried... ODB and Christy Hemi, and it was at least a fun promo, but we were now 22 minutes into the show with no wrestling. That is true. There was no buys. I, I, I can't complain, though, because this promo was great, particularly the performance of one cute Kip, 
who may be my favorite wrestler right now. And then we had the match, which was one of the worst matches of the entire year. I think CCW started, and we were not ready for it. Beautiful people against Christy and ODB. My God, was this horrible. We had Velvet and Hemi starting. Then they got the heat on her, which should have been 30 seconds max. Instead, it was like two minutes. It felt like 30. Keep in mind, part one point in the Beautiful People's promo was saying, hey, guys, Christy Hemi is not a wrestler. And here she was proving it. So some of the worst wrestling you've ever seen, ODB got the hot tag. Christy tried a uh, dive on a kid who basically caught her and buried his face in her tits. And then ODP hit uh, something resembling a side effect for the pinfall. Thumbs down. I, I just need to point out the, the start of the match with Velvet Sky and Christy Hemi. Velvet did a go-behind. She then pushed Christy to the ground. Christy lay there, and Velvet ran over and began to stomp. And it was on. Machine Guns ran into Joe backstage and uh, basically said, we're in. And Joe said when it came to allies, he had trust issues. And when the guns were fired, he was going to see if the guns fired back. Get it? Machine guns? Because they're guns, you see. Fire? So Eric Young did a promo saying he was no longer a geek. It was now serious Eric Young time, which is actually good news. We had the Young versus James. He did say here at one point, he said, you saw what Kurt did to my friends last week. And I thought, your friends, what happened last week? And I thought and thought, and realized he was talking about when Kurt Angle beat up Shark Boy and Curry Man. Yeah. So after all this time, Eric is now just, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm Super Eric. <laughs> just doesn't care anymore. Just moving on. It's serious now, Vince. Come on. Young and James Storm. Eric Young is great when he's not being a fool. Fireworks didn't even scare him this time, so apparently that was all a work. He no-sold them, yes. Yeah. So Rude tried to spit beer in Eric's face, but got his own partner, and Eric got the pin. And then he was immediately attacked to make sure the win meant absolutely nothing. And uh, why they didn't just beat the guy, I don't know. And the machine guns finally ran down to make the save, so they had chosen their side ten minutes later. Yeah. and then this, Build up some tension here, everybody. Yeah, and, and, and the match, it was, it was fine, but it was, it was four minutes of stuff, and then it finished, and then more wackiness. Borash was trying to interview Kong. And Raisha, when Taylor and Roxy attacked her, this attack lasted 10 seconds, and it was over. Now, you actually went to the bathroom and missed the prior 10-second segment with Taylor and Roxy. They were walking backstage in street clothes with pipes, and the blonde ran up and said, hey, what's going on? And Roxy cussed at her, and then it ended. <laughs> Fuck off, perhaps? <laughs> so very close to that, actually. Shit off? <laughs> I don't remember the exact sentence, but it got bleeped immediately. Get, get, get the F out of my way, perhaps. And we had uh, promise of a political roundtable smack down your vote deal with Foley, which uh, <laughs> we're still waiting for. Well, upon further investigation, apparently it's online. Well, perhaps they, they should have made a very that... poor job making this clear. I, I, I was under the impression when he said it that the next thing would be Mick Foley and three other people talking politics, which kind of intrigued me. But then we never saw it again or no. heard about it again. Then we saw Bashir choking out Rhino and... Uh, Tanae said, and I quote, he choked the life out of him. <laughs> so Rhino is now dead. Apparently, but he's at the pay-per-view, so I don't know how that works. Now, for this, and uh, they showed a lot of replays in the show, which is good. I, I, I found it funny, but at the same time, it's, it's good. At the, at, whenever a replay stopped, a big graphic came on the screen with the word replay in giant red letters flying at you <laughs> to leave no doubt that this is a replay. And it was almost like they were saying, fuck you, Vinny, for complaining about no replays. Here's a goddamn replay. To which I say... Fine. Thank you. This is how backwards this company is in 2008. We've got Hiroshi Tanahashi of uh, New Japan and Volador Jr. from CMLL. And, of course, they're evil foreigners, Yeah. first off. Uh, Hiroshi Tanahashi doesn't get a first name. He's just Tanahashi. And Volador Jr. does not even get a junior. He's just Volador. So we had Volador and Tanahashi against the Motor City Machine Guns, which was fun. Uh, the Machine Guns won, so a hell of a debut for uh, for the evil foreigners. And Bashir got really mad. He was doing commentary. He tried to beat up the Mexican, but then Rhino gored him out of his boots. And uh, that was the entire segment there. So Bashir is, he, he attacked Rhino with a lamp, and they showed a replay of this. Then he came out to do commentary. I thought, okay, Rhino's going to wrestle. And then this wacky international tag started, and I looked closely, and there's no Rhino involved, and he started burying the machine guns and putting over the uh, Mexican and the Japanese fellow, and I thought, okay, he's just going to be with the evil foreigner. And then the machine guns won, and he flew into a violent rage, and I couldn't figure out why. What 
Why, why was he so passionate about this, that that, that team Tanahashi Volador lost? And then he went in to beat them up, and, and I, I just thought, who are you feuding with? And then Rhino came out again. And it was very confusing to me. And we had the blonde interview in Christian about the uh, Legends title, which he doesn't want, which he's going to fight for at the pay-per-view. And he said he didn't want to choose sides, but if he did, it would not be with the Mafia. <laughs> yeah, that was the first stupid part. And then he said, now, Booker, last week you're hunting elephants in Africa, and this week you're a gangsta. He said, you're clearly confused about who you are, whereas I am not confused about who I am. I'm the champ. Confused. Sorry, on. Christian, you are not, in fact, the champ. Well, here's what... what I hate this this nickname. nickname. Here's, the champ. Here's actually why it's even stupider than that. He spent the entire promo burying Booker in his fake belt that he invented and didn't beat anybody for, and then called himself the fake champ. Yes. Hypocrite. Joe and AJ against Booker and Nash. Top of the hour. Free. No build. Why? Why is this not on pay-per-view? Uh, I have no earthly idea. It is the main feud of the company. Yeah. With the four of the top guys. In fact, the four top guys. Maybe not with Angle and Sting, yeah. but it's close four enough. Four of the top six. So, anyway... Uh, it was the the there were some audio issues here. We got a four way. It was a mess. AJ Pin Booker with the Pele kick, and they never even bothered to mention that. Now shouldn't AJ get a shot at the Legends title? I don't know. Does that not make sense? Sure. I don't know. It, the match was fine. It was very old school. Watching Kevin Nash wrestle is always you always hold your breath. <laughs> it's like when he he grabbed Joe for a side slam, and I expected both his legs to just shatter under all the weight. And uh, they didn't, thankfully. He got through okay, and everything else was fine, and, and, and AJ won. And if, at the time, it just seemed like a completely pointless pin. Like, well, we have a match here. It doesn't matter who wins. Just you pin you. Okay, moving on. Oh, my God. Where are we here? The Matt Morgan and Abyss promo. Oh, go for it. Well, they uh, had an argument about whether or not Abyss was still burned or whether he had healed. Abyss said, no, I'm okay. And Morgan said, no, no, you are not. And they asked again, are there no doctors in this company? So uh, Morgan said Abyss wasn't ready, and uh, he also said that, listen, you have to wrestle Kurt Angle tonight, and I can't be there. Why? Why not? Are, they, are you, do you have a prior booking? There was no good reason for this. No, he just said, I can't be there. But uh, Abyss was having none of it, and he was going forward with the match. Oh, God. Then we had uh, Borash was um, interviewing Sting about his meeting with Foley, and Sting said he would have an open mind. So Foley came out and called Sting down to the ring and said that uh, Sting was a, a good man and a good wrestler, and he respected him. So he wanted to know why he was in the main event mafia. Why, Sting, why? And uh, he said that, you know, uh, Sting basically said, well, you know, he, he wanted to know why Sting didn't want to be the glue to hold this company together as champion. And Sting said, well, the people here don't respect me like you, Foley, respect Terry Funk. And someday these wrestlers are going to uh, disrespect you as well. And Foley said, well, um, you do what you have to do, and I'll do what I have to do. And Sting said, fine, but then said, this is not your war. It's mine. What does that mean? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know at all. I do know that before Sting came out, uh, Foley casually announced. Who called him Stink? That was AJ. <laughs> AJ. <laughs> Stink? You're wrong. <laughs> but... Uh, before Sting, oh, came, back in the day. before Sting came out, came out here, uh, Foley uh, very casually announced that uh, the pay-per-view for a turning point, it'll be Kevin Nash versus Samoa Joe in their for their first and singles encounter after a year's build, build, and also Sting versus AJ for the world title. Then he just moved on. That pay-per-view is in 10 days. Yeah. At the time he made this announcement, it was the first matches announced for that show. It's the ninth, isn't it? Yeah. Isn't that the day that Impact come, or Raw versus SmackDown 2008 comes out? It may be. I believe it was. Uh, our friend Jeremy's going to have to make a decision. But, uh, yeah, they had, <laughs> at the time this show started, they had four hours of TV time to plug a pay-per-view, and for the first hour, they did nothing. Mm. <laughs> and then they announced two matches, and then moved on. And, by the way, that uh, I, I guess that was the validation for having AJ win in the tag match, was he's getting the title shot at the pay-per-view. We didn't know that for then. For the other title. Yeah. <laughs> so that win uh, still made no sense, and that match made no sense in hindsight. AJ could have beaten somebody to earn, to earn a title shot. Angle did a promo saying he wanted Jeff in the ring, blah, 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 stormed off. Then we got Angle and Abyss, which 
made me so goddamn mad. They start this match. They brawl all around ringside. They brawl up the ramp. They go into the post. They go over the barricade. They go into the crowd. They're hitting each other with shit in the crowd. And then a couple minutes later, Angle hits Abyss with a chair, and that's a DQ. Right. Why? (laughs) Because it's against the rules. I hate this company. (laughs) The rules for Kurt Angle is brawling is okay, but you can't hit a guy with a chair or any other furniture, perhaps. This was... For the first, uh, well, the match itself was just mainly just really, really, really boring. It was, uh, crowd brawling is hardly ever any good, and especially when it's not, uh, when it's just Abyss hitting Kurt and then plodding over to hit him again. And then in the ring, it was not much better. And then they just did this stupid, stupid, stupid finish, which, the, the, again, after all this crowd brawling, suddenly a chair is against the rules, and it's time to enforce the rules. Now, here's what I love. Kurt Angle hit Abyss with a chair. The ref called for the DQ. And how did the fans in the HD Impact Zone react? They chanted TNA. So we ask, we've been asking this now for like six years, what do fans, what what do they enjoy about Impact? Apparently, they enjoy bullshit DQ finishes in the main event of the program. Because they enjoyed it. They were having fun. God bless them. I don't have an answer to this. Now, uh, as we wrap up this Impact review, and as I open up the lines here oh, and, for and by some... the way, uh, Scott Steiner's the fifth guy. Oh, that's right. We should probably talk about that. Actually, I should talk about the... Uh, we should, because they got stupider. Okay, yeah, so... Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, Kurt Angle's beating up Abyss. He worked the burns, which involved dragging his fingers over uh, uh, Abyss's singlet. And then he put him in the ankle lock. So Morgan came out to save. Then uh, Booker and Nash came out to save. So at this point, it was Booker, Nash, and Angle against uh, Morgan and Abyss. Hey, look at that. Three on two advantage heels. Sure. Good stuff. Then 47 people hit the ring. Joe and AJ and Eric and ODB... And then and and they're all running wild and and yet somehow they're still getting beat up. <laughs> they still got uh, destroyed by the three uh, heels. And so then Sting came out and uh, he tried to help up AJ. He tried to be a nice guy and tried to put stop to this. And AJ responded by spitting into his face. <laughs> so Sting laid him out. And I thought, well, good for you. That fucker had it coming. Yeah, this company's dumb. Then Steiner, uh, as noted, beat everybody up. So he's the uh, fifth man and. Um... Anyway, here's my uh, question for you, and this is why this is, is, is as much as this show is better because there's a direction, there are clearly defined baby faces. Well, no, they're not. There are clearly Generally. defined sides um, in this war. My question is this. How do you win? That is a great question. That actually, is the question, actually. That is a fantastic question. The, 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 uh, the opening segment there with the main event mafia on the ramp all up on suits, and they all look smug and arrogant. And I just thought, what's your goal? But there's no there's to, no to, answer. To that's why the, that's why this can't work right now. At to, least with the NWO, the idea is we're taking over. We're going to run the company. We are from WWF and we're going to take over WCW. There was a clearly defined goal for the heels. Here, there's no goal. The closest we got was was um, I believe Joe said, or maybe it was it was somebody said, what do you want us to do? Apologize or something like that. Like, is that the whole goal? To get an apology? Like, the bad guys are going to beat the good guys until the good guys say they're sorry? Oh. There, there's no there's no goal here. Sting is so going to beat up AJ until AJ is nice to him. Well, why should we care who wins this feud? There's I, there's nothing. There's nothing no. to win. So, anyway, that was that. 